Hey everybody, I am Aiden Mattis. Welcome back to what is kind of a joint episode of the Lore Lodge podcast and the Weird Bible. Um, obviously I am joined by the wonderful Wendigad, Dad, Wendigoon, Man of Giants, who has Man of Giants, I like that. two much larger YouTube play buttons than the fake one I have. Um, <laughs> we're on our way to the silver one, we'll get there. Um, so... Today. The silver one was cool. The gold one's too heavy. It does like, look it's fallen heavy. Off that, it's fallen off that nail twice. I'm guessing and, like, that's not a command strip up there. Here. No, it's not. It was <laughs> it, you, what used to be, but <laughs> that wasn't <laughs> happening. <laughs> but thank you very much. I do like I, I do like that my one million subscribers damage everything in my home. Yeah, it's very yeah, satisfying. That's, that's, that's the way it goes. Um, <laughs> I mean, what, think about it, in like 50 years, your grandkids are going to be like... Papa Goon, what's, you know, how'd you get that? And you're going to be like, well, back in the day, before the collapse of the entire world. Um, <laughs> back before the giants uh, rose from the earth and overthrew the earth government, um, there's this thing called YouTube. And I tried to tell everyone <laughs> that they didn't listen. And that's why we're alive and they're not. Yeah, exactly. See, you know, the lizard people will get everyone but us. Uh but, so today, uh, as promised to several people who asked about when the next Weird Bible podcast would be, uh, we're doing the book of Job. And the, the first time I ever read the book of Job all the way through was, I was in 11th grade, so it would have been 2015. Um, and it was, it was hefty. It was not for a Bible class. It was for, uh, oddly enough, um, honors European lit. I'm not really sure how we ended up talking about the book of Job. Uh, we also read Things Fall Apart, which is an African book. We somehow ended up in a weird space where we were discussing everything but European literature. Um, had some, Somehow the, the Count of Monte Cristo and the Odyssey all ended up in this same unit with the book of Job. But it was yeah, interesting it uh, reading it in a public school setting because it was just constant. The whole thing was criticism. Everyone was criticizing the book. No, but there, the whole thing was, you know, how, how can God be this how, how can he allow this kind of thing to happen how can this be an all-loving god i uh, and and i think that that's definitely a bit of an issue with with this book because it's very easy to misunderstand it's very easy to read it and and come to that conclusion well how if if god loves us how can god allow this kind of thing to happen and i think that that's kind of the whole point of the book in my opinion i i don't know what you think but um, in my opinion, the whole point of this book is to explain why do righteous people suffer? What is the point of suffering? How does suffering improve us and not just cause us issues? A lot of people, of course, forget that Christians and Jews both believe in an afterlife, so this whole thing we're doing right now is temporary. But, of course, it, it goes on into, into secular life and people have questions. So, you know, I, I don't know, does it, would you be in agreement about the purpose of the book? Uh, yes, to, so I'll, I'll talk about when we get into the details of it. I would say it's not the, the thesis for all suffering. Mm -hmm. I'll say it's the thesis for spiritual trial, right. uh, which I'll explain in a little bit. But yes, yeah, for, for the most part. Sorry, I'm also want, my giant also, eagle's cup. I also want everyone to know that immediately before we started, like Aiden and I were chilling out in here, then like 30 seconds before we went live, he's like, hey, so uh, this mostly won't be a history one. You're good with explaining the concepts of Job, right? Anyway, and we are live. Hey, everyone. I did ask you several hours ago. I know, I know. <laughs> I was perfectly I happy to explain this. Well, I also I didn't I realize how much before. trouble I was going to have. I thought it was going to be a lot easier to dive into the history and really, uh, you know, touch on it and explain it. Um... It was not, because... Uh, yes, the history of Job, what an easy subject. <laughs> I mean, the history... <laughs> from, like, a biblical history perspective, it's not that hard to date it and figure out, you know, like, where did this come from and all of that. I, uh, you know, it, it enters, enters the... It enters history in a, like, extant sense around the, I believe, the 5th or 6th century BC. But does it take place then? It's hard to tell, because... There's a lot of terminology in it that fits more with Genesis than it does with Daniel and Ezekiel. And Ezekiel, of course, mentions Job and Daniel and Noah uh, in chapter 14. And so that means, yes, Job has to have come before Ezekiel, but some Bibles also date Ezekiel before Daniel. So there's a lot of confusion regarding the history. What I was able to ascertain, though, 
though the date and authorship are uncertain, is that it takes place in an agrarian society where livestock is a like primary measurement of value. That's why we get like the first thing we learn about Job, other than how many kids he has, is how many sheep and goats and cows and all of that. Um, and then we also get that he is dwelling in the land of Uz. Uz, of course, is also a son of uh, Aram, who is a son of, I believe, Shem. Correct. Mm-hmm. And so, is is it the land of Uz, as in that Uz, or is it the Uz that shows up in Chronicles, or is it the Uz that shows up in? Um, I think it's Lamentations. Just there's a whole bunch of possibilities here. In some time, some versions uh, of the book uh, suggest that it's Edom, and then there's the War Scroll from the Dead Sea Scrolls, which is not scripture, but it does address uh, a, a series of wars that will be fought between the Israelites and uh, an alliance of the Edomites, the Moabites, the Ammonites, the Assyrians, all of these different groups. And so it's supposed to be, that that's an eschatological prophecy, but it doesn't give us a ton of information because in that scroll it says that uh, the land of Uz is beyond the Euphrates, which could mean one of two things. Either this is a translation error or it was an error in terms of you know people identifying things at the time, or it could mean that this person was writing from Babylon. And that's why it's beyond the Euphrates because the, to the west. Because if it were just saying Uz is beyond the Euphrates, it would be one thing. But it says that Uz as well as Moab are beyond the Euphrates. That's not possible. Because Moab is directly across, uh, is it the Jordan? Yes, it is, yeah. yeah. So, so that's too close. That can't possibly be the Euphrates. So it's hard to figure out exactly what they're talking about. We do know that the Egyptians mention the people of Edom and mention that they're nomads in 1215 BC on one of their stellas. Um, so it's got to be between, because it's, we, Ezekiel references Job, so it's got to be between the Babylonian captivity and the Bronze Age collapse. Somewhere in there is when we're dating Job to. Other than that, there is essentially nothing, nothing to go on historically. It happened sometime in that period. My, my guess would be that it would be earlier rather than later. But that's that's about what I can come up with. So we're talking about a period. It's it's a short period of six hundred years. <laughs> Just throw a dart somewhere in there. Um, I have heard a lot of people say that Job is the oldest book in the Bible, uh, or one of them. And what what I mean by that is that the actual writing of it is the oldest. So like Genesis, for example, is the beginning of you know human history up until where does genesis end right around moses right yeah genesis ends with um with joseph and then picks up yes. in exodus with the pharaoh who does not know joseph yes okay so that period of time means that it's from the beginning of human history till the egyptian empire at least exists to some degree and it kind of goes straight into exodus because as we talked in previous episodes moses is the most likely candidate to have written genesis so that would have been a while back so the belief is that job was the earliest written book it doesn't portray the earliest events and the reasons i've heard for that are what you talked about a lot of the language being a lot of older uh, a lot of the locations mentioned being a lot older and it could be, as you said, like from the OG Babylonian Empire. Yeah. Um, so, old book. <laughs> yeah. Talking about some really old stuff. A lot of people are kind of confused by the placement of it. Uh, the Bible is not directly chronological, no. at least not the Old Testament. The, Old Testament the New Testament not. kind of is. Whereas the Old Testament's more so like different accounts. Like, for example, when you read through Genesis and Exodus, you get one telling of events, and then you read through the stories of the tribes of Israel, and then you get to Numbers, which is a retelling of several of the events of Genesis and Exodus. So um, it, it's not chronological, so Job's placement doesn't mean it's like halfway through the Old Testament. Like I said, most people place it as being much older, especially concerning a lot of the events that happen in that story. Um, was there anything else you wanted to say? about not particularly in terms of the history of the the text i like i said the the language is much more similar to genesis than it is to uh daniel or ezekiel or any of these later books that come from the babylonian captivity period those seem to have a certain literary and linguistic style to them that just isn't present in the torah it's present in other parts of the tanakh um so there's you know there's that and then i think it's it's also just to to note for those watching 
you know, when you're talking about the New Testament versus the Old Testament and compiling and chronology, you've got to remember that the, the New Testament is compiled over the course of like 50 years from the, the death of Jesus in approximately 33 AD up through Revelation, which is written sometime between 70 and 90. So the, the New Testament is compiled in less than a lifetime. It's like a generation after yep. the death of Jesus. The Old Testament, it was previously believed and is still current scholarly consensus that it was first written down during the Babylonian captivity sometime in the 6th century or immediately afterwards. Uh, or there's this new discovery that I mentioned on a previous episode, on a couple of episodes of uh, various shows actually, the discovery of this tablet on Mount Ebal that is two centimeters by two centimeters and it has a, a script that is cursing Yahweh or not cursing Yahweh is uh, cursing on behalf of Yahweh. Uh, and of course in Deuteronomy, we get told that Mount Ebal is where you put the curses. So there's a whole bunch of stuff there. Now it is dated. It has yet to be peer reviewed, but the preliminary dating for this tablet is around 1200 BC, which turns the clock back about, uh, 600 years maybe more on when the when the jews were writing things down so while the dead sea scrolls may be the earliest extant versions the earliest e existing versions of the old testament it's entirely possible that we had at least parts of it written down as far back as 1200 bc so i think that's an important thing to consider because we're looking at a possible 1200 years that it took or at the very least 900 years from the, from the Exodus all the way up to the writing of the Dead Sea Scrolls, the earliest ones, for this all to be compiled. So you're looking at a much different time scale of a lifetime versus almost a millennium. Yeah, right. Um, and that's one of the things that's interesting about a lot of the Old Testament story. I'll get more into this as I talk about the specifics of the story itself. But the New Testament is more so, well, it is... A direct attribution for us as the modern Christians or the people after the death of Christ whereas a lot of the Old Testament stories to my, to us are more so as I don't want to say fables because that makes it sound fake but uh, sort of guidelines mm -hmm. and stories of our history pretty much because a lot of the practices that we see of like tradition and abiding by the law at least as Christians that doesn't apply to us um, so therefore a lot of them are more of a story aspect than they are a direct application aspect and job mm -hmm. is especially one of those as i'll say um i wanted to say a couple things before i get started this for one i know sometimes you have a hard deadline that we need to end by do you have a hard no. deadline this time okay cool <laughs> uh because i can i can ramble about this for as long as uh, possible which is why i wanted to ask i also to wanted to so. say Thank you very much. I also wanted to say, I think this is the most viewers we've had. For Weird Bible, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, 178. So thank you all thank very you all much. It's very cool. Yeah, appreciate it. Um, so uh, if you're good on that, do you want me to go ahead and break down the yeah, basic take it plot away, man. of Job, so to speak? Uh, so the story of Job, as we establish, it's old. Not exactly sure when. Uh, but the first verse opens with, and says, There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. That man was perfect and upright, and one that feared God and eschewed evil. There were born unto him seven sons and three daughters. And then from there, it talks about what Aiden talked about, where it goes into detail, describing uh, like the, the, the oxen thousands. that he has, the goats that he has. Thousands. Well, I mean, I can. It says his substance also was 7,000 sheep and 3,000 camel and 500 yoke of oxen and 500 she asses and a very great household so that this man was the greatest of all the men of the east not not to immediately interrupt the story here but what do you think about the use of seven and three here do you think it's symbolic or literal because we see those numbers pop up a lot <laughs> so so there's a lot <laughs> there's I, I knew you were gonna ask that um there's a lot of questions when it comes to job and most of them, as we're going to talk about, revolve around the application or the spiritual implications of this story. To the degree that I've heard a bunch of pastors, uh, and like not just like yokels, like studied men, be like, oh, well, Job is a proverb. It's mm -hmm. like a fake story. It's supposed to be representative. Which, for one, I think is lazy. I think it's lazy if like, oh, story's complicated? Didn't happen. Yeah. Um, but one of the examples that they use for that is stuff like that, the direct numbers. Um, 
sometimes you can get a little schizoid, at least I can, <laughs> where you're going through and you're like, oh, the, the, the number said three. The, the three, what does Mason, that mean? What do they so, mean? <laughs> so I don't know if that's necessarily uh, something to be picked apart here. It could just be a coincidence he owns that many. Or uh, it talks a lot in the Bible about how God blesses in seven and three. So maybe as Job was just a blessed man, he was blessed in mm -hmm. sevens and threes. Uh, who knows? I, I try not to give it a ton of weight yeah. because if I do, I'll go insane. <laughs> right. Well, that's what happened to uh, Strong. I can't remember his, his first name, but the guy who wrote Strong's Concordance, dude literally went insane. Like, yeah. you know, just yeah. connecting all of the dots. <laughs> so many dots. I, I remember uh, there was there's this book. It was called, like, The Holy Number, and it was going through the Bible and, like, trying to connect every time seven is mentioned. And by the end of it, the guy was like, I I'm not sure, but um, I think I'm afraid. <laughs> like, he had, he had no analysis other than, like, this is weird, guys. <laughs> There's a lot of sevens in the book. There are, yeah. I um, Some people have said that perhaps where it is, like, a divine number or a prime number mm -hmm. or whatever, that whenever people were writing, if they didn't have the exact number, they would substitute with seven or mm -hmm. three. Um, which, I mean... We also get a lot of triads, like there's three sets of 40 years in Moses' life and stuff like yep. that. I do wonder how much of this is, you know, uh, like like the way I like to put it is not that it's a proverb or something totally made up, but more of a parable, you know, telling this, mm -hmm. this story. And, and the way that I read this one is, you know, there's a lot of stuff in there that I do question the how literal it's supposed to be. But at the same time, if you look the way Jesus explains things in, in the new Testament to his followers, it's almost always, unless it's directly to the apostles, it's almost always through a story of, of some people doing the, uh, the prodigal son parable, probably the best known one where you have the son who lives in sin and he's not righteous and he goes off and does his own thing and comes back. And the whole point is, wouldn't you rather welcome someone back to the flock than expel them from it? Mm -hmm. And, you know, so I, I, that's kind of how I've always read Job. So, um, you know, just putting that out there for people. Uh, but to continue on. Uh, so from there, it talks, so this guy, he's incredibly opulent. It says he's the most wealthy of all the men of the East, which uh, East is relative this time, but the guy was incredibly wealthy. Um, he was incredibly close to God. And it says, <clears throat> it was so, when the days of their feasting were gone about, Job sent and sanctified them and rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job continuously. I realize now that um, I missed a verse, but that's fine. <laughs> the, first time, the verse I ran over just says, um, his sons feasted in their house every one his day and sent and called his three sisters to eat and to drink with them. So essentially what it was saying is that Job, his entire family's gathered around. They all live uh, near each other. And it says that Job recognizes that his sons have committed sins, and he uh, he offers up burnt offerings for them. So Job isn't just a guy who follows after the rules of God. He's not just a guy who loves God, as it says. But he's a guy who, on behalf of his family, serves God for them. He's yeah. going above and beyond, which is the reason he's shown to have these blessings. And he's a spiritual now, leader of the family as well. Yes, ex yes. He, he is definitely the cornerstone of the family. Uh, now, this, that's not the part of Job that everyone recognizes. The part of Job that everyone recognizes is in verse 6, where it says, There was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. The Lord said unto Satan, which I'm sure you have something to say about the use of the word Satan, right? I, we covered this, I, I I, so I had, inspiring I, 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 had, I had inspiring philosophy on the show a few weeks ago, and he and I discussed this at length, because we have very different opinions on what sons of God means. Okay. <laughs> Although Satan here, I think, is in reference to a specific individual. Okay. No, I, 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 I agree, too. I believe this is the, the yeah. Satan, so to speak, rather than just the... Um, what, what, what's the direct... They did the adversary. Yeah, the adversary, uh, the opponent, the deceiver, or all yeah, various yeah, yeah. translations. Right. Okay. Anyway, so yeah, this is the the devil guy. <laughs> it mm -hmm. says, um, and the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? And Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. Which is uh, 
horrific sentence that's bothered me to this day. There, I want to do a video at some... This is tangent. This is why I asked how long do you need, because there's several tangents. Um, I've wanted to do a video for a while about the cosmic horror of the Bible. Because <laughs> there's, so, there, there's so much of it that no one knows You about. come down on me for some of the things I say as being <laughs> sacrilegious, and then you go and say the sentence, Bro. the cosmic horror of the Bible. <laughs> okay, for one... Biblically accurate angels, excuse you. Uh, but also, like, in I was reading in uh, Leviticus where it talks about what to do with the household who has leprosy. Mm -hmm. It talks about uh, the house. It speaks of it as a living thing. It says like its walls breathe with sin, and like its a uh, its a uh, its walls are hollowed out with sickness and illness. Mm -hmm. And it says when they step into the house, the holes in the wall are deeper than the wall itself. What kind of... What? <laughs> what, what, what verse of Leviticus is this? Because I'm, I'm going to pull out my uh, interlinear okay. so I can look at the Hebrew while, while we talk. Okay, I don't think this is the chat. We need to stay on topic. Yeah. This, but, the Cosmic Core episode will come later. Yeah, but that's my point. Is Now I'm like curious. I want to know what we're... I think it's chapter 15. I do not remember the verses. Nice. I think it's chapter... Pretty sure that's the chapter about um, what to do with people with leprosy. Anyway. So, it's somewhere in there. I'm staying on Job. You're not. Yes. You're not derailing. No, this no, story. I'm not. I'm not. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so anyway, um, the, the God asked Satan, "What is Satan doing?" And the part that made me go on my rant about that is, it says, um, "said I've been going to and fro and walking up and down in it, talking about the earth." So Satan's essentially just been roaming around the entire earth. It says, "And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job?" There's none like him in the earth. A perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. So for one, this is Sorry, I just I looked you're, down at chat for a second. You're good. What are they oh god, and what some, are they talking someone about? said someone said Junji Ito wrote Joe. <laughs> and I hate it. Uh, anyway. <laughs> just read three of his books. So that was scare a scary mm -hmm. reference. Anyway. So, um, for one, Job is such a servant of God that when the devil approaches him and essentially says, oh, I've been sneak snooping around the earth, essentially, trying to find um, some, way, some way to do wrong, uh, God brings up Job as a perfect man. But Job just doesn't have a testimony. If God thinks of you as a perfect person, you're, you're doing something right, yeah. like above and beyond. Do you think he's talking uh, perfect is, in terms of sinless or like as perfect as man can be? As perfect as man can gotcha. be. Gotcha. Uh, because it, it's very clear in the New Testament that Jesus was the only sinless man, the only like true perfection as a man. Uh, because specifically his wording says, a perfect and upright man that feareth God and escheweth evil. So again, I, I don't think Job was like a Christ figure. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> in that sense, ju just as perfect as man can be. I'm sorry that I put you on the leprosy train. Uh, uh, th this whole this it. whole set of things is. Just, <laughs> I know it's it, so weird. Okay, so it's it's 14. It's 14 where it's. I just want to really quickly though. <laughs> okay, fine. I, I just need to. I'm sorry, everyone. I'm <clears throat> sorry. I did this. And Jehovah spoke to Moses and to Aaron, saying, "Speak to the sons of Israel, and you shall say to them, when there is a discharge from his flesh." He is unclean because of his flow. And I just hate that sequence of words with every every part of my being. <laughs> you know what it's talking about. I know what it's talking wow. about. I hate you so much. <laughs> it's just gross. It's Those but, that don't know, ad ad advanced leprosy to that degree would cause these boils that would literally explode. Oh no, this is 15. Like, this, is this, this is talking about reproductive organs. Oh. Yeah. You, you put me on the wrong chapter in the worst possible way, and now you've made me think of things. <laughs> I'm going to keep talking about The you. look of disappointment on your face. Yeah, I'm, I, I hate you so much. Um, <laughs> there's a few places in the Bible that if, like, someone's a new Christian, they're like, what should I read? There's a few things I will never recommend. Yeah, there's a few Job, things that are not the Job's answer. Job's one of them. Leviticus is definitely one of them. Yeah. Uh, just stuff. Anyway, the, the problem is Leviticus so, sneaks up on you. Because you get Genesis and Exodus, and those are totally fine. And then Leviticus. And you're like, ah. Yeah. But uh, yeah, Job. Uh, we're on Job. <laughs> we're on Job. Stop it, Aiden. Okay. <laughs> so anyway, 
uh, God essentially astutes Job as being this perfect person, or at least as perfect as a person can be, which is a lot coming from the creator of the universe. It says, um, Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? Hast not thou made a hedge about him, about his house, and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. Put forth thine hand now, and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. Um, essentially what the devil's saying here is, well, the reason that Job loves you so much, and the reason he's such a good person, is because everything's going good for him. If things were going bad for Job, then he would curse you to his face. He would just be an another awful person. Mm -hmm. It's easy to be good when you're on top, right? So it says, And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power, only upon himself, not forth thine hand. Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. And I won't read all of the verses that follow, uh, but essentially what happens is Satan then goes to Job, and he begins to put afflictions on him. Uh, initially, it says that uh, his oxen begin to die out, and his sheep begin to die out. Then from there, it says that he becomes inflicted uh, with these boils and these sores all over him. Um, and things continuously get worse for him up until the point that one day when he's out in the fields, a great, I think it says a whirlwind, right? Um, pretty sure it's a whirlwind. I don't have my book open, but i that sounds about right. And, and it's, uh, yeah, put forth thine hand now, and the Lord... So, uh, and the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he is in thine hand, but save his life. I forget. Okay, so after the first point, um, at first the devil goes to him and says, While he was speaking, there came also the fire of God falling from heaven, burned up the sheep, um, and consumed them. Then after that, after several of his uh, goods are destroyed, it says, Then Job arose and rent his mantle. Renting your mantle or essentially tearing your clothes yeah. is a sign of mourning or humility throughout the Bible. Um and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worshipped and said naked came i out of my mother's womb naked shall i return hither lord gave and the lord hath taken away blessed be the name of the lord all this job sinned not or charged god foolishly so job has a level of faith that is hard to truly grasp he hasn't had everything taken away yet at this point he's lost several of his goods and what he says is like he i also like the mention that he rents his mantle it's not like this sinless uh, not sinless and you know the righteous sense, but uh, yeah. right yes thank you the, this righteous person isn't a statue it's not like bad things happen to him and he's just like well that it just be like that sometimes he rents his mantle he's very depressed and broken by this but what he says is the lord gives and the lord takes but through it all, blessed be the name of the Lord. So it says at the beginning of chapter 2, again there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, which I know is a whole. <laughs> that, that phrase is We won't talk about it. I've already discussed it in other, about... in other episodes. <laughs> if you're interested in the sons of God discussion, go watch the episode 51 of Lord Lodge. It's with Inspiring Philosophy. He's great. We have a whole conversation about it. I won't get into it here. And I know there's also a lot of people uh, who have come to this from my channel. For those that don't know Aiden, if you think this sounds insane, this is the man's entire channel. <laughs> so feel free to <laughs> check that out. Anyway, it says, And Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. The Lord, which is a whole, again, a whole nother thing in itself. But the devil comes before the Lord. It says, and the Lord said unto Satan, from whence comest thou? And again, Satan answers and says, from going to and fro in the earth, walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. The same thing that he said the first time. And still he holdeth fast his integrity. Though thou movest me against him, destroy him without cause. And Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, yea, all that a man hath will he give for his life. Put forth thine hand now, and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse thee to thy face. The Lord said unto Satan, Behold, he is in thine hand, but save his life. Essentially, if you're saying that his flesh, if his skin is what matters to him, then you can do whatever you want to him, just don't kill him. Yeah. 
Doe went Satan forth from the presence of the Lord, smote Job with sore boils and the sole of his foot unto his crown. So he's essentially covered in sores all over. Then he took him a potter's shed, scraped scrape himself withal, and he sat down among the ashes. All right. So, <laughs> yeah, it's, the line about uh, it's brutal. Potter, it's, it's horrific. So potter's shed or pot potsherd is essentially like clay like sharpened clay yeah. so to speak like a pot material uh the guy is so miserable with these sores that he takes this pot shirt and uses it to scrape the boils off of his skin literally flaying goes, his own skin yeah the, to get relief from how awful it feels uh, and it says it's from the crown to the sole of his foot um so this guy is in a horrific position. And after this, it says, Then said his wife unto him, Dost thou still retain thine integrity, curse God, and die? So his wife sees this misery and says, This is insane that you're in this situation. Why don't you just curse God and be over with? Just die. Just get this over with. Which is a very encouraging Not wife. a very supportive <laughs> wife. I gotta be honest here. <laughs> not, not, not the best. <laughs> it says, But he said unto her, speaketh as one of the foolish women speaketh but shall we receive good at the hand of god and shall we not receive evil and all this did not job sin with his lips it says now when job's three so job's continuing to maintain his status and again he essentially says what we said before the lord gives the lord takes away it says, now when job's three friends heard of all this evil that was come upon him came everyone from his own place it names the places they came from um says when they lifted up their eyes far off and knew him not lifted up their voice and wept and they rent everyone his mantle and sprinkled dust upon their heads towards heaven so they sat down with him upon the ground seven days and seven nights none spake a word unto him they saw that his grief was very great so when i mentioned i was trying to find the verse and skipped over it um job's family who it mentioned as being sinful at the beginning of the chapter they were also killed when his oxen were killed. The mm -hmm. turning of events was Job runs out into the field to check the oxen. While he's out there, his house collapses and his family's killed. <laughs> then after that is when the devil's like, oh, well, he's still a good guy because he's not sick. So <laughs> the devil was kind of reaching there. Yeah. Uh, and it's <laughs> after that. <laughs> go, go ahead. I was just going to say, it's like, it, it's just kind of, it's kind of a funny argument when you think about the whole concept of god being like yeah you can take everything he has he'll still love me and and we just end up here where the devil's like well he's still alive so <laughs> at he least he's got that yeah. Yeah, he's still... <laughs> if you just yeah, let me kill is... the man he couldn't worship you anymore he lost his money and all his riches and the devil's like but if he's itchy mm -hmm. did, did we consider what happens then um, anyway, that, so that's the reason that, that I didn't make that clear, my apology. Whenever he rents his clothes and says, the Lord give, the Lord take away, it's a much more it's like over-the-top thing to say because he had just lost his family. And it's from that point when his wife says, curse God and die. Mm -hmm. um, it says when his friends come to see him, they don't even recognize him. That verse which says they saw him afar off and knew him not. He's covered in boils. He's laying among the ashes of the riches he once had, scraping himself with pottery in order to make the suffering go away. It says that uh, they didn't even recognize him because that's the state that he was in. And his friends sat there with him for seven days and seven nights. So the rest of the book of Job, pretty much all of it, except the last half of the last it's chapter. a lot of speeches. It's the, yes, it's the conversation that these four men have. Uh, the conversation between Job, his three friends and obviously uh i do not have the time nor do you have the do you all have the patience to hear all of that it's a, it's the a synopsis lot. it's a lot it's literally uh 20 uh, 40 chapters for for, <laughs> for those of you who did not have to uh read this and write papers on it for school you're lucky it was it was not an, an enjoyable experience so it was, it was more were... enjoyable than job's experience but yeah, that's saying a lot. <laughs> and no, I do not want to summarize them. It has been years since I did that okay, work. Right. You know it. You the, know the, it better than I do. The very short version of it um, is that each of the friends present different arguments for how Job is to uh, confront this. One of the friends is along the lines of his wife, where he's like, "Yeah, you should just tell God to, you know, 
get rid of himself yeah. and die. Like that's that's your best case scenario. Why don't you just die, Job? Yeah. Um, another one of his friends um, says that Job should be angry. He should be furious against God. That Job should dedicate himself to fight against God. Uh, and the third friend wants him to do nothing right he's mm -hmm. like you should just wallow here in the ashes forever mm -hmm. essentially am i right I, if i remember um, correctly it's, it's basically it, it's it's, it's, a, it's a, like it, it's pretty much the nihilist idea of like man this sucks anyway <laughs> like, so like you shouldn't not, you shouldn't curse god and die but you you also should just do nothing just do nothing about it. yeah and, and then the third friend who's like what if we fight god um <laughs> <laughs> essentially what the story is just a this quick again... tangent have you seen the reddit post from some it's like r slash witchcraft or something and some girl is like i went on to the astral plane to fight allah and we are not ready to face him and it's just an entire thread of reddit witches talking about how they're not powerful enough to fight god it, it's so oh. <laughs> I've not seen this. <laughs> Internet witchcraft is like my favorite genre of stuff. It's wildly unhinged, but carrying on. <laughs> anyway, yeah, every time I read that stuff, it hurts, but it is funny. Um, anyway, so that's one of the reasons we talked about earlier how a lot of people kind of interpret this as not being a literal story. I interpret it as being literal because as we mm -hmm. established, I'm very literalist with most of the stuff in the Bible. Um, but... Here, one of the reasons that they do that is because each of his friends are presenting, I guess you could say, the three narrative arguments mm -hmm. against continuing to follow God. One suggestion uh, nihilist... I've seen regarding that is that the stories of what happens to Job, the, the first part of the book where he's God is allowing Satan to te test him, were written first, and then the speeches were part of a later addition to the story that were bringing it into more of a parable territory, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. That's one of the scholarly opinions. Um, I don't know how I feel about it, but. Yeah, so it's essentially, um, it's the idea that this part is literal, this part isn't, whatever. Um, uh, again, assuming from my interpretation that everything's literal, uh, his three friends are offering what is three natural human responses to a situation yeah. like this. I did everything right. I did everything as I was supposed to, and bad things still happen to me. Um, now what's interesting is Job's narrative throughout the book of Job. So Job doesn't start the story, well, like I mentioned earlier, he rents his clothes. He's not like a statue. And whenever he first, let me, I flip through the 40. Yeah. He displays human emotions, for which is an important, he displays an important emotions, thing to note. Exactly. <laughs> like, yes. <laughs> He's not like a monster through this thing. As a matter of fact, the first thing he says, it says, after this, Job opened his mouth. This is after seven days of silence. It says, and cursed his day. Job spake and said, let the day perish wherein I was born. The night in which it was said, there is a man child conceived. Let the day be darkness, let not God regard it from above, neither let the light shine upon it. Let darkness and the shadow of death stain it. Let a, let a cloud dwell upon it, let the blackness of the day terrify it. And he continues on throughout the entire first chapter to talk about how it shouldn't exist. Verse 10 it says, um... Verse 11, it says, Why died I not from the womb? Why did I not give up the ghost when I came out of the belly? Why did the knees prevent me? Um, and he continues to talk about uh, that he just shouldn't exist, which mm -hmm. is, again, a very natural reaction to going through a level of tragedy like he did. Uh, and at the end of the chapter, he says he wishes that he would die. He says, For the thing that I greatly feared has come upon me, and that which I was afraid of has come to me. I was not in safety, neither had I rest, neither was I quiet, Yet trouble came, um, and because I won't get into like the philosophy of it yet, but essentially what Job's talking about there, it's the purpose for the book of Job. Um, but he says, "Which long for death, but it cometh not, and dig it for more than it uh, uh, that digs for more than hidden treasures." He's saying it would be a treasure at this point for him to die. So Job again, Job has a very human reaction to this, and that's where his friends' arguments come into play. But it's through his friends' arguments that Job changes his, disp um, his disposition. Whenever one of his friends approaches him and say, why can't you be angry? Why can't you hate God for it? Job essentially, again, he's still in torment. He essentially answers, well, I only exist. You only exist. My children only exist and my wife only exists because of God. All of this, the entirety of the human experience could not exist in absence of God. So who am I then 
to be angry at him for levels of that existence being taken from me. Mm -hmm. Another one asks him, well, why doesn't he curse God and die? And he essentially answers the same thing. And it's through the conversations with his friends, uh, friends is a loose word here, uh, it's through the conversations with these people that Job begins to change his own spirit. Um, and then towards the end of the book, I, I feel like I'm talking too much. Do you no, want to you're take... fine. You're, I'm, I'm learning right now. Okay, all right. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> um, at, near the end, which fun fact, he talks about the power of the Leviathan and the Beast of the Deep, which is a whole... <laughs> I'm, yeah, not, I'm not going to let a mention of Leviathan go by. Um, you're a big fan of them. I know. I'm a huge fan of them. He says, in, I, I have to read the verse now, at the beginning of chapter 41, he says, Canst thou draw out Leviathan with a hook, or his tongue with a cord which thou lettest down? Canst thou put a hook in his nose, or bore his jaw through with a thorn? He makes supplications unto thee, will he speak soft words unto thee? He make a covenant with thee, will he take down servant for thee? He continues to lay these hypotheticals out says uh, behold the hope of him is in vain shall not one be cast down even at the sight of him which man the leviathan's so cool <laughs> that's a recurring topic in scripture anyway um we got to touch on that in one of these we do need we, to we gotta do a leviathan. whole ep episode on biblical monsters <laughs> yeah, bro <laughs> leviathan that, that's why i said cosmic horror you got yeah. on to me but i know i know I, it was it was the term up. cosmic horror that got me <laughs> I know, I know. The, the I Orson Welles Bible translation. <laughs> I hate you. Anyway. The OWT. So, anyway. Um, at the end of the story, his friends have given them this entire thing, and essentially Job has come to a recognition within himself. He's completely turned about face from his initial, initial disposition. Again, it's 40 chapters of speeches they have among each other. Um, at the end... At verse 42, at the, uh, in chapter 41, he talks about the power of God, mm -hmm. why God's so important. At chapter 42, the last chapter of the book, it says, And Job answered the Lord and said, I know that thou can do everything, that no thought can be withholden from thee. Who is he that hideth counsel without knowledge? Therefore have I uttered that I understood not things too wonderful for me, which I knew not. Here I beseech thee, and I will speak, I will demand of thee, and declare thou unto me. I have heard of thee by the hearing of my ear, but now my eye seeth thee. Therefore I abhor myself, and repent in these dust and ashes. Which Job has talked about. The story opens with God essentially calling Job like the perfect man, or again, mm -hmm. as perfect as man can be. Here at the end of it, Job is calling himself a fool. He says, I had only heard of the miracles of God, but now I see the power of God. Things that were too, it says, too wonderful for me, which I knew not. And here it says he's mourning. He abhors himself for not seeing the power of God before. And now he repents in the dust and ashes, mm -hmm. calling himself a fool, which is completely different from the guy we saw before. Mm -hmm. But Job elaborates on that. It says, and it was so that after the Lord had spoken these words unto Job, Lord said to Eliphaz the Timonite, Eliphaz was one of the friends mm -hmm. who was here the whole time, My wrath is kindled against thee and against thy two friends, the ones who are trying to essentially talk Job into mischief or turning from the path. For ye have not spoken to me that thing that is right, as my servant Job hath. Therefore, take unto you now seven bullocks and seven rams, and he essentially commands an offering, which is a thing that happens in the Old Testament that doesn't apply to us now. Moving on. Yeah. Um, it says, And the Lord turned the captivity of Job. He prayed for his friends. Also, the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Then came there unto him all his brethren and all his sisters and all they that had been of his acquaintance before did eat bread with him in his house. They bemoaned him and comforted him over all the evil that the Lord had brought upon him. Every man also gave him a piece of money and every one an earring of gold. So the Lord blessed the latter end of Job more than his beginning. He had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, and 1,000 she-asses. And also seven sons and three daughters. And he called the name of the first, and it talks about the names he gives them, and in all the land were no women found so fair as the daughters of Job. Their father gave them inheritance among their brethren. So... 
after the can, go ahead can i really quickly interject on that um, absolutely yeah for those of you who aren't aware i'm a freemason um we have an appendant body for young women, <laughs> for young women called job's <laughs> daughters which comes from that exact line in the book of how all of job's daughters are the fairest in the land um i just it just Did occurred to me that. and i wanted to bring it up because it's just one of those little Did things know that. Interesting. yeah you also Is have rainbow before, girls that before or after the goat sacrifice there's no goat sacrifice <laughs> I do uh, like inter I do like answering that question, emphasizing different <laughs> words. Like, there's no goat sacrifice. There's no goat <laughs> sacrifice. That's, that's like, good. I just appreciate to, just the to humor. screw with people. It's really fun. <laughs> yeah, don't worry, guys. We've talked off camera, and he's yeah. told me that there's no goats. It's just the sheep. Okay, just the sheep. Anyway. And that comes from Welsh tradition. Uh <laughs> <laughs> that that's purely um, historical. <laughs> no, no sacred anyway. That was the other thing I had. Speak just to not not to totally derail, but the historical thing. You mentioned how uh, they had to sacrifice the the bulls. Um, mm -hmm. Part of the reason why the Romans were so hesitant to recognize Christianity as being a legitimate religion is because it was the only one that existed at the time that Rome knew of that did not involve sacrifice. So to them, sacrifice was an inherent part of religion. How could you have a god that does not require sacrifice? You don't, but sacrifice. Yeah, like, because, and, and the whole idea of Christ sacrificing himself was so alien to them that we have, we get, we basically through the, the implications of all of this, we learn that the Romans had, that Christianity was a revolutionary idea for the time. So I just think that that's an, an interesting historical tie into all of this. Oh, I will take you back off of that to continue this um, and continue to waste everyone's time. In my Sunday school All class, 300 going, people seem to be enjoying it, so... 300, oh, 300! Very cool. Thank you all so much. That means a lot. Thank you, guys. Uh, in my Sunday school class, we've been going through the Book of Acts, doing the study of it. And one of the most fascinating stories, I don't think it's brought up enough, is Cornelius. So Cornelius was the first Roman convert to Christianity, or at least the first one mentioned first in the Bible. First recorded one, yeah. The, biblical story, the first recorded one. And uh, it's Peter directly who witnessed to him. And Cornelius, it says he was a man who sought after God, and one day while he was in his house, um, an angel came to him and said, go send for a man named Simon Peter. So Peter comes to his house, and essentially he explains Christianity to him, the idea of Christ. And Cornelius' response is exactly what Aiden says. He talks about, but how can this be for sacrifice? And um, how can this be? How can you have uh, what? What's his word? Uh, payment without sacrifice mm -hmm. or whatever? Um, and Peter says that there was a payment for, it and it was Christ, the one who was crucified. And Cornelius says, how could it be that a man I've never met loved me enough to? Die, uh, loved me enough to be my sacrifice to pay the penance for me and peter says that's the whole point that's the whole reason officers are here that's the reason we're so on fire for him that's the reason we mm -hmm. have the spirit because he loved us that much and from there cornelius and his entire family saved as the first convert yeah. uh, and it's from exactly what you were talking about that the idea of no sacrifices was so alien to them at the time um, anyway so at the end of job so job has gone through this entire thing it says his life was doubled. He had twice as much at the end of his life than he did at the beginning. It says, after this lived Job 140 years, saw his sons and his sons' sons even four generations. So Job died being old and full of days. So the beginning of his life, Job had all of these goods. He, had, he, was, he was the richest man in the, in the land yeah. at the time. Um, and then Job through this trial then on the other side of it he has twice as much than he did at the beginning um, he continues to not only be blessed in his life but to have a blessed long life um, the way that says he sees four generations of his family carried out which is a blessing in itself and he died being full and old of age but the most important blessing to me isn't the well obviously you know having a family back and having you know uh, being able to see your generations is a big deal. But even more so than that is at the part I read at the beginning where it says Job, as a human, says for the first time he recognized with his eyes the power of God that everyone else has only heard with their ears. There are a few people mentioned throughout the Bible, Old Testament and New Testament, 
who really experienced divinity, who really experienced the power of God or what God is on earth. And every single one of them had it do something to mm-hmm. them. <laughs> every one of them uh, went above and beyond. It talks about how um, Saul directly viewed God. Saul, for those that don't know, murdered Christians, the Roman government. He was essentially a paid hitman. And then he saw God once and became an immediate um, um, evangelist, essentially, who went from town to town. He was the first missionary. Beginning, beginning with him it. witnessing the death of Stephen, right? Yes, yeah. yeah. That, that was immediately before he converted. Yeah. Um, which, Stephen's its own whole thing. Did a uh, Sunday school lesson on that. That's where it makes me emotional. I won't get off on that one right now. But um, so everyone who sees God directly... It's blessed, and they can't shut up about it. They, uh, uh, it essentially defines them for the rest of their life. And Job was one of those few people who had that blessing, but he had to go through this trial to achieve it. He had to go through this to see it. Uh, but through it all, Job never said anything against God. Job never attacked God. He wished for God to strike him down, but that's different. That's not a hatred for God. That's a, that's a pity of oneself. Yeah. Um, and it's, and it's still, at the end of the story, doesn't say that Job sinned at any point for being miserable or for wishing death upon himself because again it's a natural reaction but instead job maintained his faith throughout Mm it um now before i talk about the philosophy is there anything you want to uh i would i would like to address just as a thank you to two people in the chat we had uh, i'm gonna make sure i grab their names uh heavy burn man sent us uh fifty dollars from from oregon he is also named aiden so thank Thank you so much for that um now i'll actually be able to you know split the money from this show and Send Wendigoon money for dinner. Um, <laughs> and Max Waters for ninety nine ninety nine said, you don't know me yet, but you oh. will, which is honestly a little disconcerting, but I hope it's a positive. Um, <laughs> this is fantastic. Yeah. Thank you we do, very much. We do, very towards kind. the end of the show, do a 30-minute a question segment. Um, and the, the way we do that is we answer Super Chats first, and then we get to any other questions that we can before we run out of time, um, which tonight, I suppose, will be determined by when we get tired <laughs> so but yeah that's all i um, want to do is just i wanted to make sure i said thank you to those people and for everybody who's in the chat just hanging thank you so much for for being here it means a lot to us uh, also so two things for one if you have questions start leaving them in super chats now yeah uh, so we know to get to them or if it's on your mind the super and chat also, function does preserve it too so it makes it much easier for us to find them uh also the current goal which aiden doesn't know i'm going to say this the current goal is for Aiden to quit his day job. So my campaign is that we need to get enough views going, we need to get enough subs going, that Aiden can do stuff like travel for missing 411 videos, and uh, he can do this stuff, because Aiden's a fantastic presenter, and I really want him to be able to make court more content. So show Aiden all the support you possibly can. He appreciates it, and I appreciate it too. Anyway, so, are Thank you good? You. Yeah. That was welcome, Jeff. Very kind of you. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> anyway. So, you cheering up? A little bit. <laughs> you Not gonna up? lie. <laughs> uh, anyway, so um, that's the story of Job, right? And obviously, the hard part. And I'll be honest, I don't like. I, I'm a Sunday school teacher, right? People come to me with questions all the time, um, and they'll come to me with questions about, like, New Testament. Any day of the week, I'll knock those out. Like people come up to me and they're like, "Oh, what? Uh, what does this mean? What's Pentecost? What's uh, what, what's the Holy Spirit mean?" I'm like, "Got you right here. This verse, blah blah blah." Uh, and a lot of the Old Testament stories are like, "Hey, why did uh, Moses do this or why did this?" I'm like, "Oh, well, that's because blah blah blah." And like, I love answering questions, but there's a few questions I hate being asked or I dread being asked more specifically. Um, not like I get annoyed, but it's because I'm always afraid I'm not giving the correct information. Mm-hmm. Uh, those would be questions of uh, predestination. And I don't believe in pre... Okay, so like predestination is the whole thing that like anyone who's supposed to be saved will be saved eventually. And the justification for that is if God exists outside of time, then he can see all of time front and back. So he knows everyone who's getting saved. The reason I don't like predestination is because everyone I've talked to who believes in it uses it as a justification to be lazy. Yeah. Yeah, I've had conversations with people where they're like, well, I don't really soul win because, you know, if they're going to get saved, they'll get saved, which is a horrible philosophy. I don't like that. Um, so I'm like, I'm like anti-predestination, right? But then people are like, oh, okay, well, okay, so if God's timeless, then how does time work? And stuff like that. Stuff like that's like that's, a little bit more tricky. That's something I've been Especially thinking about a lot teacher. lately. Um, 
and and the idea of omniscience and omnipotence and then still the fact that certain things happen that you know there are certain ways that it's phrased and I, and I often impress upon people the fact that while this is the word of god it is also the work of man compiling it so there could be times where something was misinterpreted or there could be times when something was misrepresented that's why i'm always very very picky about what translation i use that's why i hate the new international version and the new living translation they're both horrible do not use them mm -hmm. um but yeah so those two those two but yeah but the the point there is you know there are certain things that crop up and i think people are very quick to assume that i you know god is ignorant of them or god is uh choosing to allow suffering or something like that who when you when you take a step back first of all god's omniscience is not something we can comprehend you know, omniscience is not something that the human mind is capable of understanding when you think about it. We're looking at literally the idea of understanding and knowing everything that has happened, can happen, and will happen. Um, and then omnipotence in much the same way, you know, you, does what does that mean? Is God able to snap something into existence? Or does it mean God is capable of creating the structure that creates something? Or, you know, are we talking about magic or are we talking about a Rube Goldberg machine? Like, what's that? And I... Yeah. You know, it's, it is it is things like that, that when you get into the idea of teaching it to children, it, it is such a huge responsibility. And I, mm -hmm. I'm i glad you take it as seriously as you do, because I know there's a lot of youth pastors out there who just really do not. Um, and Don't get me started. Yeah. <laughs> I, I know a few of them. Um, someone made a point in the chat, I think, of, yeah, Fretful Gaze. They said, maybe God knows all the possibilities and we have the choice to pick those possibilities. And that tends to be the philosophy I go down because, yeah, God can see everything. But it's also emphasized heavily, especially by Jesus, that we have choice, that we have free will. If you've listened to my previous rants on this show, then you know that I'm of the philosophy that the reason humanity exists is the concept of free will. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, God had the angels and the other heavenly bodies, but he didn't have companionship. He didn't have someone to choose to follow after him. So without choice, we're no... Well, What's the point of humanity? Mm -hmm. um, I, I, a lot of people are like, what's the point of existence? And my argument for the point of existence is the choice of returning to companionship with God. Mm -hmm. um, so choice has to exist. Uh, that's not just my opinion. That's mentioned throughout the New Testament. So my idea is like, sure, you can believe in predestination or whatever, as long as choice comes first, because mm -hmm. uh, that's doctrinal. And then beyond that, you can argue whatever semantics you want. Um, I like to think of it in but, some cases as like hitting the start button on a, a piece of code or something like that like you know what it's supposed to do you know what it's gonna do but it doesn't happen until you hit start so Correct. do you program yeah, in free will and then you know all the possibilities of what could happen there's a whole bunch of if else statements and stuff like that so you know everything right. that can happen and that can come to pass but does that necessarily mean like with free will there's now the possibility that any permutation of those things could happen and Correct. I, I yep. look at it as God knows every possibility, not necessarily, you know, and, and, pe and it's uh, people always expect, I love atheists talking about the simulation and the multiverse and everything. I'm sitting there like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I love how, like, Step every, further, guys. <laughs> I, I love how every uh, now and then people accidentally invent the Abrahamic religion. <laughs> Have you seen that? You'll have these yeah. people be like, I feel like all the energy and spiritualism is like a person, and I call them him, mm -hmm. like a sort of father figure, almost like an omnipotent father figure, almost like an omnipotent father figure who cares for my existence. Yep. Like, you're, you're, you're so, so close. close. You're, you're getting like, there, man. You're like, you're knocking so on the door. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but yes, um, with, uh, I, I can't even remember what our original point was. Ah. <laughs> like, uh, well, while you think of it, I'll take the break to uh, address a couple of super chats. Aiden Paladin said, "Money from one Aiden to another." Thank you, Aiden. Uh, I'll let other other Aiden know um, of your your generosity. Uh, Frostwolf01 for ten dollars said, "Thank you both for the interesting content, and thank you both for this podcast. This has helped me understand the Bible in a way I could never, and helping with my faith." And that is what we. That's why we do it. <laughs> that is the reason um, is to help pro provide something that maybe you can't get in church. Maybe not. And it might not be, it might be because somebody doesn't know how to talk to you about it or that you're not sure how to ask the question, but to discuss these things in an open way that really works for everybody and, and, you know, where you don't have to feel any sort of shame or guilt or something like that for trying to understand, but rather you're allowed to have questions. You're allowed to be curious. 
Um, I, I really appreciate comments like that because not only as like a content creator, YouTuber, or whatever, but just as like a Christian, that means a lot. So thank you. Yeah. Uh, and Problematic Farmer said uh, for 50, y'all should do a live reenactment of scenes from the Bible. Which ones? <laughs> yeah, which ones would be the real question there? Like, I wouldn't be opposed to it. Uh, I'm going to be down your way a couple of times this year. But um, yep. Yep. that would be pretty funny. Yeah. Um, Thank, uh, but thank you very much. For Thanks, guys. Um, anyway, so I remembered what I was talking about. So you were talking about how uh, I, there's a few questions I don't like getting asked. And I do take it seriously because I, I don't teach, like, kids' kids. It's, like, high school, college age. Yeah. But still, a lot of these people, it's the first time they've ever considered these things. Or I'll, I'll be asked concepts about, like, free will, existence, whatever. Like... I could be the first person who's ever told them so if i start them off on the wrong foot there's no telling you know where that will go so mm -hmm. i do take it very seriously um that being said job is one of those job is something that i am hesitant to, I, did, I did a study with my class because most of them are very mature and you know been in church a long time so it's not like the first time they've heard it um and it's one of those stories that I'm worried that part of my personal interpretation overrides what I say the biblical interpretation is. Mm -hmm. I'm I try to be careful about that, like how what I think it means versus what God intended for it to mean. Um, but I'm fairly confident. This is the same thing I told my class. I'm fairly confident that Job is an application for a righteous and looking believer. Mm-hmm. What I mean by that, and this is one of the, my biggest issue with Job, isn't with Job itself, it's with the way people talk about the story. Because Job is viewed as one of those gotchas, right, against Christianity. There's mm -hmm. a lot of those. Where it's, it's along, it's not quite as bad, but it's along the same thing where people are like, oh, you're wearing polyester, can't wear polyester. It's kind of like eating shellfish. You're not supposed to eat shellfish because they like heard a verse that was mentioned to one group of people there's like a line in ago. leviticus that applies specifically yeah. to the jews of the time because you're going to get trichinosis if you eat pork and it's undercooked like right and, <laughs> and they're like ha huh, you're eating pork guess you don't read the bible it's one like that whole thing right job is also seen as kind of one of those gotchas where people will be like oh well you're reading the book of job uh, or like ah oh, the book of job is very anti-believer it's very bad for christians um and the problem with it is whereas the shellfish thing i could be like yeah it was to a specific group of people it doesn't matter anymore that's kind of what the whole jesus thing was about um like that's an easy answer but job doesn't have as much of an easy answer as someone who's not a believer no so i i, I want to preface what i'm about to say with saying this is not a story <laughs> that i think is a um uh, not, not that you shouldn't hear about it if you're not an experienced I like Aiden getting his dog to come in the background. Oh, there he is. Look at the boy. He was just staring um, at me and wagging his tail, so it only seemed appropriate <laughs> to... Um, it's, it's not something that... I don't want to say should be under... Or try to be understood, because that's incredibly pretentious. It's not something that I would focus on. Uh, not to say that you should be arrogant to it, mm -hmm. but because it's a different application. Than what a lot of people think this is. It's not saying that if you're a Christian, you're a guinea pig who's going to get prodded every now and then yeah. by God. Um, it's a greater purpose, and I believe what the greater purpose for that is is that Job was an individual who was, I would say, as perfect or probably the best. No, actually definitely the best person alive on planet earth at the time because if you're so good that whenever the devil's like oh, i wonder how i can take down god that god puts you as his front man that's a that's a level of faith and understanding beyond anything i could yeah um i don't, I don't know anyone who would consider themselves close to the faith of job that god picks mm -hmm. you as his front man right there's only a few people in the bible who kind of get that treatment it's like him enoch elijah him, Enoch, Elijah, um, Jesus. <laughs> that's cheating. Uh, <laughs> uh, but fair yeah, enough, it's enough. just it's it's just like a few people who get called to that degree, right? And when you think about the billions of people who have lived, like yes. that, these are these are some pretty special humans. Yes, absolutely. Um, 
Like, so, so jo Job was above and beyond, right? I don't, I would never consider myself an eon, a, an inkling of whatever faith this man had. Mm -hmm. um, it's because of that, Job is in the situation he is now. A lot of people hear that and they think, oh, well, because he followed God, God essentially ripped him off or whatever. But that that's the wrong way to look about. It. And this is what I mean by it's not something I would focus on if I was an early believer or if I was someone who's just trying to figure out mm -hmm. the Bible. Because as a believer, someone who believes in God as much as I believe in error, yeah. or, you know, any other concept on earth. I see a righteous honor, the position that Job's in. Mm -hmm. When I was talking to my class about it, the analogy I made was <laughs> that of a soldier, right? We, in a lot of our stories uh, throughout history or even American history, we see, um, we, we could take a story of a soldier going off to war. Or take, I'm just being... Um, of like a stereotypical American. Let's take yeah. World War II, right? We think about we war story, a lot here. <laughs> we, we think about war a lot. Um, think of like the soldiers who stormed D-Day, right? There's a lot of valor given to them. The idea of like, ah, oh, these men, they went out into the braves of battle in order to fight for your freedom or whatever. I'm not getting right. into the politics of freedom. You know what I mean. Yeah, I there's, uh, there's an honor to that kind of class throughout all of history. Now, what if we take a situation where a soldier is drafted Mm -hmm. to a type of combat it's a completely different scenario it's viewed as almost universally an astute evil if a government or body takes someone against their will and puts them into a place of heroism mm -hmm. right and a lot of people but we do Job look at those that. people as even more heroic yeah yeah oh yeah absolutely as the individual we think wow what a uh that these people who had to face these odds to do this um what a um horrific scenario but what what brave men they are to rise up through it but at the same time we view the people who did that to them who sent them mm -hmm. over as, as tyrannical as evil a lot of people view job as a draft scenario they view it as god was like oh here's a punching bag have fun with him and throwing him to the devil um and if this was done to just some random believer I would agree with that. I would say that this is <laughs> like definite, uh, not necessarily unfair, but it's uh, tragic. If you, if you grabbed a random person off the street, if you just yeah, like, if rude. God was like, "Hey, there's this guy. <laughs> he's in he's in the city called Babylon. Why don't you mess with him for a little?" If it was like that, then yeah. Joe was a different degree. It was to a higher calling. And the way that I came to understand the book of Job is I ask myself, if I believe in God to the degree I do, I don't have any doubts of the faith. Mm -hmm. I don't have any, like, complication with, um, am I, like, if I do something that's wrong, I tend to feel, like, repentance and know mm -hmm. it's wrong. Um, like, uh, I try to follow after, you know, God's teachings and all that. So asking myself, if God were to say to me, I'm going to put you toe to toe with the devil. <laughs> yeah. Like you're the you're the guy. Again, I don't think I have that faith. But if God's like you're the man, you're going to be the front line to this. The devil is going to do everything shy of killing you, mm -hmm. right? But story of what you do and the faith you have through it go on to inspire thousands of years of Christians and followers who come after you. And not only that, at the end of it, while you're still alive on this earth will experience the divinity of god one of the few humans on earth to ever do it would you do it unequivocally i would say yes because a lot of people view this is kind of a bit more philosophical just direct bible mm -hmm. a lot of people view achievements in life as being things like amassing wealth uh living a long time being happy things like that but from a biblical perspective i see a lot more of the use in life as being value rather than time right i think of some of the most well-lived lives as being that of the martyrs think about uh the think about the prophets who were killed early on i'm named my first name's isaiah and my father named me after isaiah after the prophet isaiah who was a prophet to the kings until eventually he was sawed in half because they didn't like what he had to say about god but that testimony of Isaiah lasted until what six thousand years later my father decided to name me after that man mm -hmm. that is that is something to the stars that is a reputation beyond anything i could imagine uh i remember hearing an interview with mike tyson or not mike tyson muhammad ali mm -hmm. uh, back when he was boxing they asked him after a fight uh, ali if you could be remembered for anything what would you want to be remembered as 
Muhammad Ali said, I want to be remembered as the oldest person who ever lived. Mm-hmm. Which obviously coming from Ali, you know, he could say whatever. He's remembered as one of the greatest boxers. Yeah. But a lot of people have that same sentiment, that idea that like, oh, well, a good life's a long one. And while that's true to some degrees, and those blessings also come with other blessings, I view more as the value of what time you do have compared to what it is. Mm-hmm. And I think there's several causes like Christianity that are worth dying for. Mm-hmm. Um, so as someone, and again, this is why I say Job isn't something that should really be studied if you're struggling to come into the faith, which is one of the reasons that it annoys me. It has the reputation it does. If I was in Job's place, I would want to have a reputation that's worthy of history other than saying no and letting the judgment pass on for me. But not only that, Job had his blessings restored to him. Why you can't, you know, if you lose someone, it's not like getting a new person replaces that individual. Mm-hmm. Um, but to have your earthly blessings amassed, um, to have this testimony that's lasted from all of history till now, like we talked about, this could be before Moses. This could be the, the earliest story of the entire Bible. Mm-hmm. And for now, for at the beginning of the podcast, when I said this guy was about it because God said, this is my man that yeah what what's that worth mm-hmm. in years or time uh so i th- i think that job was made a martyr if it were me and i can say the same about job because as it says he was the most righteous mm-hmm. man at the time uh, i feel job would say the same that it was worth it yeah worth the testimony yeah so. it's I, I mean he's cemented in history forever now like as being yeah. Yeah. one of the most righteous men to ever live which is a pretty mm-hmm. In in a human sense, that's a pretty incredible thing, and then in a spiritual sense, it's also uh, on the same level. Like, there's there's literally nothing I can add to what you said because it was so beautiful. Uh, like, I have I have, I have nothing to <laughs> nothing to add to that. That was an incredible monologue. It's <laughs> very kind. Thanks. You have at least one of um, those every time we do this show, where I'm just like, damn, <laughs> that was good. You, you tee it up for me, um, but yeah, that like. Again, that's why I don't, I, I don't hate that people know about the story, and I'm not like, oh, you shouldn't read that. But for someone who's struggling to learn about the faith, it's like, oh, is, is this what's going to happen? Is God going to, like, team me up against the devil mm-hmm. periodically? Some of the... We are giving yeah, you, like, I, the I, most extreme possible example of what you will go through, but yes. you're going to go through, like, you had every qualification for a job and still didn't get it. What are you going to do now? Are you going to curse God or are you going to keep trying? Or are you going to like, you know, strengthen your faith and push on it's versus if yeah, basically the, that's, I, I think that's the, you know, the very easy interpretation looking at it, probably not the core one or the primary, the, the most important, but to look at it and say, well, if Job can go through all of that, I can get through this week, like mm-hmm. that kind of thing. And, and, and that's, that's how I present it to people when they ask is like, yes, if you read this, it's going to sound brutal. But if you think about what the message is here, it's that righteous, even the most righteous will suffer. Even the most righteous might even question through that suffering. Yeah. And and the, the key is to keep going, to keep believing, and to, you know, understand that better days will come. That this isn't the end. The, these bad things that happen to you are not not the end you have the opportunity to push on. You have the opportunity to make something of yourself regardless of how much you're struggling. And I think that's a very important message on its own. Like, and isn't that one of the most beautiful parts of it, though? You said that, like, it's not wrong to interpret because it talks about after this happens, Job wants to die. Mm -hmm. That's like, did I do something wrong? Like, I I cursed the day I was born. Why do I even exist? Like, and... um, talks about how blessed a treasure it would be if he was buried in the ground like through all of that at the end god says he maintained himself as a man of the faith mm-hmm. like that wasn't a sin that wasn't a wickedness that he went through you know if temptation or doubt was sin then jesus would have been sinful because jesus was tempted in the wilderness um like we're all human we're going to experience things that are wrong but for job to go through this level of persecution and then come out of it not only with his blessings restored twofold but to say i have seen the glory of god um it's that's like the greatest upscaled version right guy loses everything then sees god directly and has it all restored and then you scale that back to us maybe not a perfect christian definitely not a perfect christian in my case um i'll go through trials that during the time i question why 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 is this happening i don't deserve this why am i going through this 
every single time that it happens, I've been able to look back at my life and say, oh, that's why. Mm -hmm. that this is the blessing I've achieved. And I, that's, and like that's said, wisdom. That is what that is, is to, to have experiences, to have them negatively affect you, and then to look back on it and be like, all right, that's the lesson. Like learn to that that is what wisdom is. It's to learn from your your experiences. I remember um, got not not to get too personal with it, but um, I was asked by a friend of mine. Uh, I I went through like um, no, nothing major, just like a breakup a while back, like years ago. Uh, and I remember like I, I had a friend I confided in. Uh, who I was pretty sad about. And he asked me years later, he was like, um, I didn't talk to him in a while. He's like, you're doing really good. And uh, I remember when he asked me, like, he was like, you're doing really good. I was like, oh, the last time he saw me was then. And then I started thinking about my mindset at that time. And then I looked to now and realized everything that I learned through that made me the person I am today, the capabilities I have with all of that. Uh, and like with, in a situation where I am blessed enough to have this YouTube channel, uh, I'm blessed enough to have like, great relationships in my life um it's all stuff that i couldn't get to had it not been for those trials so i like what you said that job is kind of the underlying bold super version of what could mm -hmm. happen to anyone follows the faith because if you've chosen this is another thing a lot of people don't think about if we have the freedom of choice we're inevitably going to make wrong decisions yes right only thing that can push us back to right decisions or the right direction is a breaking of whatever path we were going down, right? Mm -hmm. if, you, if you have this amazing job lined up, or like if, God, if God's graced you with the job to have in the future, um, if you don't have other doors shut for you, you're never going to walk down that one. Mm -hmm. I never would have started YouTube had I not uh, become discouraged with my college career and not like the direction that was going. Just, and that's such a minor thing, but just like... But it's real. I don't, like, that's what matters. It's, it's personal. Like, we're, there's, not, there's no one personal experience that's going to apply to everybody. So it's important to be open and, like, you know, here's, here's where my life went wrong and here's how it got back on track. And I have a very similar story to you. I wouldn't be here hosting this show if it weren't for a breakup I went through in December of 2020. Like, there is a direct line of events starting there that leads to here. And did it suck at the time? Yes. Did it suck when I didn't get a job that I really wanted back in February? Yes. Would I be here if I wasn't put through those things? No, I wouldn't. Uh, what? It's the exact... Yeah, exactly. And uh, what I find most comforting about it is I, I, I know that as tr it's easy to say this when you're on top. Like Job, right? It's easy to say it when everything's going well. Uh, but I hope that I am at the capability that if things go wrong again... I will have the faith that this is just another mm -hmm. step to put together because he's got me this far. But right? Suffering is temporary. Suffering is temporary. You know, I was thinking about while I was reading through Job, um, do you see my, vi I say it like I'm the first person who came up with it. Do you know Chris McCandles? Chris McCandless? Yeah. The guy who uh, died uh, while he was mm -hmm. backpacking up in the north. Um, there's a poem that he wrote his final letter on the back of. Mm -hmm. Uh, I forget what the name of the poem is, but there's a line in it that's always that stuck with me since I researched that story that I thought about for here, uh, where it says, oh, it's uh, men in their final hours. It's talking about deathbed thoughts. Mm -hmm. And in the poem, it says, to give up uh, to give up flesh and bone, make a monument that stands among the mountains and the stars is mostly to shed weakness. Mm-hmm. To think about that situation with Job, like, yeah, Job suffered. He went through physical pain. He went through loss. But look what he gained for it. Not only seeing God and his blessings restored, but to be a monument of history that people still look at Job, even people who criticize it, they're mm -hmm. like, can you believe what God did to his most faithful person? Mm -hmm. Or what God did to the most faithful man who ever lived? Like, like I'll, I'll hear You're people... You're still complimenting Job. <laughs> complimenting job yeah because of what job went through because of his discomfort because of his loss he still remembered i have heard people who don't believe in a single word in the bible say huh that guy's got the patience of job mm -hmm. it's just a phrase the patience of job because that's what he was remembered as yep um like i said i would hope i would do the same scenario but i know job being as righteous as he was in that scenario he would have accepted it it's not a soldier being drafted it's a soldier going to battle yeah I agree. And and I think that we that, can, there, there's a super chat in here that I would love to use as a segue if you're up Absolutely. For it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, from Colonel Frog 98 for five pounds sterling. 
Uh, I've been trying to understand natural evil, so I was hoping if you could help enlighten me on how an omnibenevolent god can create or allow natural evil. Mm. Which, if you were... We're doing the tank. I, I, I can take it. First? I can take it, yeah. <laughs> okay, all so, right. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I think this is kind of what we were addressing with the free will scenario, where, yes, God is all-loving and all-knowing and all of that, but also experiences time and existence in a much different way than we do. For us, a lifetime is a, a snap of a finger for God. So what we see as, you know, all of this suffering through life and all of that, it's at, at the end of the road, there's an, there's an entire existence after this, as far as Christians, Jews, and Muslims all believe. We are, we are looking at, you know, what we do here. It's not necessarily a test, but the idea is that there is something afterwards. So the suffering you undergo on Earth is nothing compared to living eternally in in grace and in the glory of God. So you got to begin with that mindset that we're not, you know, this is not it. This is not the end. This is not all you're ever going to experience. So what ex what happens on Earth is not necessarily, you know, a permanent final thing for you. To, to worry about and yes god may put you through suffering god may expose you to suffering I, I should rephrase that god will never put you through suffering god will allow you to suffer um you know and and a lot of people will say okay but what about you know wh what about four-year-olds who are diagnosed with cancer how is that fair where is the where's the lesson in that and it's not necessarily that god is trying to teach you a lesson if you're four and you get cancer and, and you you don't make it your god isn't teaching you a lesson god is calling you home I don't know what you, you have to say that. <laughs> ah, ah, that was, ah, <laughs> stop it with the calling home stuff. This isn't fair. <laughs> Why is that not fair? Uh, uh, it's just, that got me emotional. Just oh. the way you phrased that. I wasn't expecting that dump truck of a sentence. <laughs> ah, I man threw it. Man, uh, 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 uh. all right. Anyway. Is that something you disagree with? Is there something you. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, 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 I'm about to cry. Is oh, what okay. Saying. All right. Like, yeah, yeah, well, you yeah, made yeah. me cry earlier, so it's only fair. <laughs> I know. I know. That's why I can't be mad. Uh, oh, j just when you said calling you home, I wasn't expecting that to get sidelined like that. Mm -hmm. um, what I would say is that in humanity's original purpose, again, as I said, I'm of the firm belief that humanity's original purpose was companionship to have um, close nature tied with God. Um, and in the garden, we were given choice because if if you, to make it in purely forms we can understand, if you were to build a robot, and the robot was programmed to do everything you say, is that robot a friend, <laughs> or is it? Good point. <laughs> you you could you could anthropomorphize it in your mind, but it's just it's just following code, right? It's mm -hmm. just following orders. That's not what we were made to be. We were made to be creatures that were capable of choice. It's not a relationship if the person is in, if they're incapable of leaving you at any point, if there's no trust, if there's no actual love there. Uh, and the purpose, that's, again, the purpose of the tree and the Garden of Eden was because without it, there's no choice to be separate from God. There's only different ways to follow God. The tree was the out. That was the choice to separate ourselves from God. And as man, we chose to separate ourselves from God. Um, through that, it says that is the moment that death and sin came into the world. The function of death is not to make people suffer. The function of death is to not to take away some aspect of this life. The function of death is if one chooses to in life, to return that com to return to that mm -hmm. companionship that we were meant to be with. Exactly. Um, because of that, because of choice, because of free will, we've allowed it to infest throughout the world in different forms. Um, like use cancer for an example think of all the toxicants think of all the 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 metals the different poisons that have been put into the air and in water and everything else by man's decision mm -hmm. how many people have decided to destroy something and the effects of it exist for hundreds and hundreds or thousands of years i think that's an um, important point yeah because you got to also consider that not you know j just because something happens to an innocent person does not mean that that was solely god's decision by giving us free will we he put us in the position where we have polluted our water we have polluted our earth and our air it's you know we're at a point where he's not he was never going to snap his fingers and save us from ourselves it's our responsibility in life to act in an upright way to save ourselves
Mm -hmm. The per that's why like God talk Jesus talked about the importance of being a steward of your planet. And I like the word steward. It's like God created this world, he created everything and we're given ownership of it. We're given a, it's not just like we get to do with it what we please. Mm -hmm. We're given the responsibility. Jesus talked about being kind to animals. He talked about not to make animals suffer. He's, you know, talked, obviously they ate meat and stuff like that, but he talked about never putting the animal to where it needlessly yeah. suffered or never. Uh, he talked about why it was important to steward nature um, because like we've been given a responsibility to take care of it. And a lot of people have messed up that responsibility mm -hmm. and because of their sinful actions or because of their choices to be away from God's gift. It's caused death and destruction to enter the world. The easiest example I've used Think of a um, think of a drive-by shooting, for example. You have a group of people who have decided to do something evil, and they drive down the street and they decide to just shoot a random person. Right? Is it that random person's sin that led them to death, walking on the side of the street? No, that's just a needless sinful consequence of someone else's choice. And a lot of the times, our choices don't just affect us; they affect people mm -hmm. around us. And here on this earth, we've been given the opportunity of free will, and we've messed that up a lot. That's where a lot of sickness, a lot of death and pain come into the world. As Aiden said, that's not a punishment to the person who's affected. In some cases, it's... Some, man, you got me with that calling home thing. Yeah. Um, it, it, <laughs> in some cases, um, like Aiden said, in some cases, it's removal. Mm -hmm from the evil of the world. And I, th I think it's our responsibility, not just, that, that's why a lot of people like, I hate the stereotype that Christians are like, care about nature, don't care about stuff. As a matter of fact, it's very direct in scripture to care yeah. about things like that a lot. Um, a lot of people haven't, and it's led to the consequences we have. So I would say that, to answer the question instead of rambling this whole time, um, things like direct evil from a benevolent mm -hmm. God because of the choice to remove ourselves from a benevolent mm -hmm. God. And I think there's just to, to you know add a final tag to that. It's also the, there's you know one one aspect I hear a lot is what about children? What happens to people who die before reaching the age of reason? You know, which is kind of the biblical limit for we won't get an age of what that is, but the right. age of reason. When can you think for yourself? And to me, in my opinion, we like if you think about the time that this was being written and the people it was being written for. In my opinion, that would be cognitive full cognitive development, which is age 25 so you know there if you take it liberally there could be a very very long time before which you're actually being um you know not to use the word punishment because of the connotation but before you're going to be facing you know judgment for your actions at the very least we're talking about children you know if if a child dies they're not dying in sin there is original sin but they're not they haven't sinned they haven't done anything wrong they're, they've got a. They have. They the, have, they have no the Disney concept. World Fast Pass to heaven. Like they are. You don't need to worry about what's going on with the children. They're. They're good. You know, God loves them. They have not sinned. They are as pure as they can be. It is those of us who who are given, you know, this longer life who have the responsibility to monitor ourselves and uphold ourselves in a morally upright and righteous way. Um, Isaiah seems very disappointed with me for saying Disney said, Fast Pass Disney to heaven. World yeah. Fast Pass to heaven. Oh my word! Am I, I, am I so wrong much. though? Am I wrong? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you can argue anyway. with me. You're allowed to argue with me. Oh, you're right. That's why I hate it. If you're wrong, I just, it'd be easy. But you're not. Uh, are you Are you ready anyway. for for a new topic? Because we got one. Or do you want to go back to Job? Uh, just well i i mean with that final thing of what i feel the book of job means unless you want to add on it i feel pretty firmed in that I'm like trying um, to fix my headset here yeah uh yeah i mean we can i i think that that's wow we covered a lot of ground um we cover a lot of ground. <laughs> but yeah i mean i'll I, if we we can just keep it going because there's stuff that just kind of ties in here okay. um and i'm going to ask you this one and then i'm going to run to the bathroom really quickly um, so I'll Very let cool. you field it, uh, but it's a, it's a good one, um, from Jetstream, uh, for $5. Uh, do you think this is the first version of humanity God has created, or do you think that God has created universes before and then restarts every so often? So I'm going to let you answer that while I quickly exude. Interesting. Okay. All right. All right. So between all of us, while Aiden's not here, um, Aiden's doing fantastic on the channel want him to continue to do fantastic and i'm probably 
going to uh, periodically donate money, but none of you all can mention it because this man needs to do this full time. He's fantastic. He has fantastic plans for like the missing 411 series and all that. And he needs to quit his day job so that he can do it. Uh, and I'm determined to make this happen one way or the other. So this is my new sabotage plan, but it's a reverse sabotage plan. I think that's called money laundering, but that's definitely not what I'm doing, at least not on the record. Um, so I'll got to help me with this. Anyway, uh, <clears throat> he'll probably be back soon to pretend I'm answering the question normally. What what was even the question? <laughs> oh, it was it was were were there generations of humans before us? Um, anyway, I do not personally believe so. Uh, and again, a lot of that is because I take a very literal view when it comes to um, Christianity. So, for example. Whenever it says in the beginning at Genesis, it says in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. For me, that's enough to solve it. I feel like the concept, and I'm not saying that it's like wrong to believe it or anything. I feel like there's a few questions you could not only ask about biblical you know, nature. You could ask about anything that are just unknowable questions. Like, for example, the whole what if your red is not my red thing? Like, oh, what if, what if, like, your red is actually the way I see green, but we both call it red? That's one of those, like, theoreticals that you can never know. You can never, like, you know, ask enough questions to get around. And the whole, were there cycles of humanity before or after us, I feel like is one of those. I think it's a really cool topic, which if you saw my Conspiracy Iceberg series, I talked it up a lot. Um, but, totally lost my train of thought there. Um, I was lost in Aiden's eyes. Um, Oh, but uh, I feel like it's Beautiful one of those baby blues right here. Yes, yeah. <laughs> um, feel, uh, I feel like it's one of those unknowables, so I don't personally think so, but I don't think there's anything necessarily wrong with it. Again, I'm not sure how you would even determine it, per se, if it were to, so. Yeah, I'm, I have a feeling I know exactly what you said, and I just agree with you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, there I you go. I don't, I, say I, yes, I think, it's fine. yeah, you know, I mean... I think it's pretty clear that at the very least, this is the first version of humanity and of the universe, uh, or at least of the universe. And I think that the humanity question, you could maybe say that Noah onwards is humanity 2.0, but yeah. Okay. Well that there was kind yeah, of, a I, I don't think that we were recreated Noah, but... at any point. Um, just yes, maybe, you know, correct. narrowed down to an extent. Um, yeah. and I think that that's, Genesis, sort yeah. Of, but... Um, yeah, I think we're that's the story we're getting in Genesis is like, you know, humans are created and then there's a catastrophic event and then society restarts, but humans don't. Um mm -hmm. let's see. Uh we also have we have one from Spicy Italian, um, for fifteen dollars that simply says doggy. <laughs> Appreciate that. I see uh, Italian. Also, if you have questions, ask the now. Yeah, it's kind of definitely. question time. So um yeah, we've, we've kind of done a soft segue into question time. Um, yeah. But since the questions are generally related to Job, it works. Um, Plaz for $20. Thank you, Plaz. Uh, says, reposting for visibility, game wreck for y'all. El Shaddai, Ascension of the Metatron, follows the journey of Enoch trying to bring justice against the Fallen Watchers. Has some really cool and trippy segments. Well, if I can stream it, maybe I will do that. Um, been wanting <laughs> to get back to Twitch streaming, so I'll take a look at that. Um, over on Twitch, on the Aiden Mattis. So, yeah, that's, I'll see about streaming that as well. Um, have you ever played any biblical games? Most of them are not good. <laughs> Most of them are not good. I want to play the Dante's Inferno game. Uh, I remember when it came out and I had questions. <laughs> People lost their mind over it because it's like, it's got like all the women depicted as topless and stuff. But it's yeah, like, like, yeah, but they're like giant monster centipede things. That doesn't Yeah, count. it's not really. Um, yeah, D Dante is also not scripture. So yeah, depicting so it is not blasphemy. Enough. Like, Correct. Um, <laughs> there you go. There's my justification. Yeah. Can't wait to tell the Sunday school class. <laughs> <laughs> uh, problematic Farmer $5 says, here's some monies. Well, thank you. <laughs> I appreciate the question. Thank you, thank you uh, Problematic Farmer. What a great name. <laughs> Uh, History Daddy for five British pounds says, love you guys. Closest modern humans have come to Alexander the Great. <laughs> uh, he, he, his, a big part of History Daddy's content is that he simps for Alexander the Great. So this is actually quite a compliment. <laughs> then he says, uh, and if Atlantis is real, would there be any giants there? Um, 
I mean, my belief about Atlantis is that it is the antediluvian society described in Genesis 6, so I would say yes. Yes, yes. correct. That's where the skeletons are. <laughs> yep. Um, Next question. <laughs> there's a lot of people just saying giants. Ah, uh, yeah. All caps. My people. <laughs> uh, it's my squad. <laughs> one guy goes, uh, one bird all stone goes, okay, so Job is that guy. Like... Like, the devil came down and went, you are not that guy, pal. And he said, yes, I am. Like, <laughs> I am that guy. <laughs> uh, it is you... funny. It is The devil was defeated by Job's faithfulness, which, again, mm -hmm. yeah, that's the point of the story. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, heavy Burn Man for five says, uh, how does one join the Discord? The Discord link is in my uh, is in the description of the video. Um, it, it Just down in the little description area there. Uh, you can also shop sustainable products at Guy Industries. They make bamboo products, and I highly recommend them. And then uh, we also have a brand partnership with Target. So, um, you know, Target. That's also in the bio. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Isaiah, do you have a Discord? Uh, I have a closed one. It's for the old Got patrons. Gotcha. There is a public one that is about me, I think, but I am dumb too. If, so I don't know if, you, if there is them. anything you want to plug, feel free to do it um, while I search for the next Super Chat. I'm also scrolling through the chat right now. There's a bunch of people making memes, which I appreciate. Love memes. Uh, especially about Job. <laughs> it's funny. I do love coming to this group chat. And a uh, group chat. Coming to this podcast. Mm -hmm. And normally, like, in my head, whenever you were like, we're doing Job, I'm like, okay, people are probably not going to like it, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. But then I come here and everyone's like, ah, oh, Job's that guy. The man, yeah, exactly. The boy, it's Joe, which is very. <laughs> People cool. are into it. People like it. Uh, Diane Yale for fifty dollars. Uh, full full disclosure: This is my grandmother. Um, says well oh, done. Thank you. Thank you. That's thank so you, sweet. Grandma. <laughs> That's so sweet. Uh, we have one person who said can't donate on my phone, but I have a question. What would be a weird but really cool topic theme uh, you guys would appreciate in a worship song? I don't listen to a, a ton topic? of worship music. A topic in a worship song? Like a topic for a worship song to cover. A biblical topic. Like, are, is this a sing-along? Like, it's a biblical story? I, I, I don't know. That's, I mean, that's, that's kind of like the... Do they... I guess, like, the theme oh, of the song. Because for me, like, the, the Christian music I listen to is, like, Reliant K and Skillet and Thousand Foot Crutch. Like... <laughs> yeah, most of the Christian music I listen to is more... I don't want to say bluegrassy but kind of like country yeah. or choir orchestrated um most of, most of christian music i listen to is like a lot of the old classics i'm trying to think of a uh like very recent because most, most of them are like old like, you know um I, god for the lighthouse and all those i can definitely are, give you the fire I, I can give people some contemporary like christian songs to listen to if they're if they're looking for new ones like reliant k is Fantastic. I, I don't know if they're necessarily contemporary anymore. They're from the 2000s, but um, I am understood by Reliant K. Uh, Therapy, who I am hates who I've been. Um, there's another one that's an acoustic one um, that I'm trying to remember the name of, uh, but it's it's from the same album as College Kids. Uh, but it's like an acoustic one, and the whole thing is about I, uh, you know accepting christ and accepting god and, and living your life in a certain way and and the whole the, the whole song is just very much like about understanding that you're not perfect and that you're not expected to be and that the goal is to try and to put genuine effort forth um and that one just always sticks with me uh you know i'll try and try and remember what the name of it is before the end of the show but uh problematic farmer for ten dollars says i love the bible that's that's good Oh, that's good. I, I know that, I, I know you're Jewish, so I'm 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 assuming you love the the at least the Old Testament part of it. Um, let's see, we've also got got a lot of these tonight. Uh, for two pounds, Sir Four says, "I hope God shares secrets of the Bible in heaven." It is my understanding that all will be revealed. Uh, it talks about that how um, whenever a believer goes to heaven, how uh, they become knowing of all like biblical secret stuff which again a lot of the concepts we talk about have to be dumbed down the very nature of the way we talk about them is done down compared to mm. divinity and yeah. eternity stuff that we can't even really comprehend like existence that is forever without blemish 
what on earth does that mean? There's like, just no way to understand it. Yeah. So, um, but yes, all will be revealed to us. So, yeah. Um, Reynold Hughes. It's kind uh, of the whole goal, the whole long term yeah, exactly. <laughs> destination. Yeah. Yeah. So Ray says uh, a podcast, Weird Bible, a podcast where Aiden and I say try to make each other cry. <laughs> is, that's kind of what it is honestly at this point yeah yeah i thought i had him be and then he hit me with the old one too uh also hi ray appreciate you being yeah. here as always the song i was trying to think of by the way is getting into you by reliant k um and it's just yeah. it, it's one of those songs that if you are a christian you're gonna sit there and listen to it and it's gonna make you cry um just because that's the, the way it goes uh History Daddy for two pounds says, as an agnostic, would God view agnosticism as bad? Um, not to step on any toes, but probably. And the way, the reason I say that is because God talks about those who believe but do not act, mm -hmm. or he specifically refers to them as the lukewarm. Mm -hmm. um, those who, those who like under he talks about the hot and the cold there's those who understand god there's those who follow god and there's those who do not believe or follow god mm -hmm. the non-believers and then there's those who know but don't do anything about it um so I, I it's kind of up to the individual if an agnostic would be more like oh i theoretically believe in a kind of god so they're more towards the cold side um or if they're like yes i believe in jesus christ i just don't care yeah, that would also that's probably that would be worse in my opinion. I, I, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. yeah, that would be worse because he talks about um, the hot and the cold, but the lukewarm I will spew out of my mouth. Mm -hmm. Can't be a good thing. Uh, no, <laughs> essentially, like though he talks about that throughout the entire Bible, like uh, uh, those who know better mm -hmm. don't act on it. Um, I think we've talked about that on previous podcasts. Yeah. So like those who are persecuted the worst in life are those who knew God directly, mm -hmm. uh, or like kings who were ordained by God and then turned their back from Him. Yeah, it'd be closer to that line. Um, I, I think which it's is kind of a belief that's pretty common across Christianity. Yeah, I think it's very much dependent on where where the where the agnosticism is coming from. If it's you know, if it's that you've never been exposed to it, then I think that that's a much more favorable position than those who have been exposed to it and still reject it or those who have been mm -hmm. exposed to it but um are only you know believers in name and at the same time i you know my, my personal interpretation of you know the the way that the, the afterlife works is not that hell is a necessarily a physical place of eternal suffering for all non-believers but rather that after you die there is a, a, a possibility for purification um, and that that's the goal because I don't think, you know, I, I just don't see, I don't know. I know that there's, there, there are segments where hell is described as being, and this is, I think the first episode of the show that we ever, maybe the second one, um, where we talk about hell at length, but you know, the kind of the conclusion mm -hmm. I came to as I was researching for that was there's not, um, that, that hell is not, that there is, there is a place of eternal fire and torment. But that is not necessarily for us. That is for, uh, you know, the the Watchers, for example, from Enoch. Um, you know, that that's that's what that is. And then we have the opportunity for purification and for redemption because the goal is not to, you know, cause eternal suffering. It's to bring you closer. And if you reject it, then you might not end up in a place of eternal torment, but you likely will end up separate from God and that that's not an ideal place to be. There's a verse somewhere in the new testament you're just gonna have to trust me it's in there somewhere uh where i think it's hebrews where it talks about judas um and it talks about how judas committed such an evil uh, like there's been people in history who have betrayed other people right mm -hmm. like that's just a thing that happens but judas was evil not only because he betrayed a perfect person but because he spent so long around divinity he knew better than anyone what Jesus was about. Think about that. Judas had a better idea of who Jesus was than you or I ever will, mm -hmm. the side of eternity, at least. So, like, Judas had no excuse for anything he went forward with. And um, the Bible talks about those who do have no excuse 
those who know better. I th think of the parable of uh, Lazarus and the rich man, mm -hmm. right? Um, short version of the parable, for those who don't know, there was a man named, uh, there was a rich man who lived in the city, and there was a poor beggar named Lazarus who lived at the front gate of his house. And every day, the rich man would enter in and out of the gate of his house, and Lazarus the beggar would try to tell him about God. Lazarus would try to tell him about Jesus, try to tell him about God. And every day for years, the rich man ignored him. And then one, uh, then one night, whenever the rich man dies, it says he lifted up his eyes in hell, and he blames Abraham. He sees Abraham, and he blames Abraham and say, "Why didn't? Why wasn't I told?" Mm -hmm. And Abraham says, "Every day for your entire life, you had the testimony of Lazarus, and yet you didn't follow mm -hmm. God." Um, and that is throughout the Bible viewed much more harshly than those who simply do not know. As a matter mm -hmm. of fact. Uh, it is kind of a topic that's up in the air of what happens to people who flat out never know, like mm -hmm. those from far off tribes. And the, like I, again, I'm solid enough in the faith or in my own faith that I'm willing to accept. I just don't know what happens to a lot of people. Um, Paul talked about God's grace is sufficient and beyond our understanding. I would like between you and me, I would never teach this in Sunday school. I never teach this as doctrine because this is just opinion. Mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't be surprised if God just see the heart, sees the hearts of man and like the capability or the concept of belief in them if they've never heard the testimony of the word of God. Yeah, and like that's enough for me. But but I just think God's faith is beyond our understanding. So I would say that that person's better off the person who was raised in church their whole life and decides that God's just not for mm -hmm. them or whatever, and I think in my that, own opinion. That, that goes to a, you know, just kind of the idea here. We all have a moral inherent sense of right and wrong. And I, and you know, when you get to Christianity and if you follow through Judaism up to Christ himself, what you get is that people know right and wrong and Christ is kind of the perfect example of right and wrong. Throughout the Old Testament, you're having God telling the Jews, here's what's right, here's what's wrong. And in some cases, they succeed in following those rules, and in some cases, they fail. And that's why we have so many of these, these judges and these, these eventual things that happen to, to the Jewish people throughout their history. Um, and then Christ comes along, Christ is perfect. He, he, is, he is as close as you can get to God and man in one thing. So I think that, you know, for, for people who were never exposed, if you read the book, what, what I take away from it, and again, just like you, I would never teach this as, as doctrine, but what I take away from it is we're not dealing with um, a, you know, a situation where they're going to get up to, to the pearly gates and St. Peter is going to go, ah, sorry, well, you know, I know you weren't aware, but you can't come in. You're, you're going to hell. I don't think that's the situation we're dealing with. I think that they would be judged based on how they behaved, how they acted. Were they good people? And they would be told about God. They would be, everything would be explained. But I don't think that they would be, you know, judged for not knowing God. I think they would be judged for their inherent sense of right and wrong. And did they follow it? The, um, I'll talk about that in Romans. Because the church at Rome was asking what of the la the shores of I forget what land they talked about it was somewhere far away they're like what of the shores of them can't we go to prophesy that essentially Paul was saying why the mission in Rome is important he says um do not lose sleep essentially over those like yeah well yes it is good to tell them of the love of Christ um stay where you are be uh, something something to the effect of um God's grace is sufficient. God's yeah. grace is enough. And I don't I don't have to understand it. I'm going to trust the guy who made the universe that when he says that, he mm -hmm. means it. Uh, and I'm going to leave it well enough yeah. alone. I, I think when you um, try to interpret it and try to, try to, you know, make it into doctrine that this is how mm -hmm. you get into heaven, this is how you go to hell, you, you get some things like the Albigensian Crusade, you get the Northern Crusades, and just these moments in in history where what if we Christians kill them? Went, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Where where Christians yeah. went way too far and and made horrible mistakes and did bad things, all in the name of spreading a faith that they were told God's grace is sufficient. It is not their responsibility to to go there. It's it's you know, and just like us, I think a lot of people take the uh, the line "Do not cast your pearls before the swine," and they they take that and they're like, "Are you calling?" non-christians swine it's like no it's it's not about that it's do not try and force people to believe and the reason they use pearls and swine is because pearls have absolutely no value to ba to pigs like it's that simple they're not Correct. they're not saying you are pigs if you don't believe they're saying you it's not your responsibility to force it you know they're not going to understand the value so don't bother tell them 
give them the good news, but if they don't accept it, it's it's no longer your responsibility. It's not you don't need to force it. Be open, be accepting, be a resource, but it is not your job and it's not good for you to go and try and force people to believe what you believe. Always mm-hmm. be open, always be willing to under explain and to accept, but do not do not force. And I think a lot of Christians have made that mistake. That verse about pearls before the swine comes specifically talking about biblical doctrine. Um, so it's essential for those that don't know, it's saying God, Jesus said do not cast your pearls before the swine. Or in other words, if you go up to someone who's like, hey, who's Jesus? Don't be like, hey, can I explain to you the concept of predestination? Mm -hmm. Like, and people try that. Like, that sounds ridiculous, but I cannot tell you the number of religious leaders I've met who will argue with someone who's never heard the word of God about the concept of Pentecost. Mm -hmm. Like, stop. (laughs) That's that's not, so so the purpose of the place you start. (laughs) that is not the place you start yeah like the purpose of what jesus was saying was like do not take this in the right order that's kind of what i was talking about with joe yeah like a bunch of people who have no concept of like you no know, or true concept of jesus or christianity will look at joe and be like wow imagine how terrible to be a christian but for like me that is an uplifting mm-hmm. story but yes if you know nothing of christianity it's a terrifying story yes yeah, again the pearls before the swine exactly it's yeah. just understanding that um, that kind of leads us into this next super chat, though, which is uh, from Jack Manson for twenty dollars. Do you think the Crusades were justified? Why or why not? As a historian, I have many opinions. Um, <laughs> for, I, I don't know if if, if you want to take the the first swing at this one, but oh, you 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 go for it. Buddy. Yeah, so I'm as, actually going to go to the bathroom real quick while perfect. you're doing that. So 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 here's the deal with the Crusades. Um, they are taught poorly in in school. A lot of people learn about them as. Uh, you know, the, the Pope decided that we just needed the Holy Land back, so we're going to call this huge army together and go in for it. That is not what happened in the situation uh, that led up to 1095. So in 636 AD, uh, just, just four years into Islam's existence, uh, Muhammad's armies took, took Jerusalem at the Battle of Yarmouk uh, in 636 AD. And they defeated the Byzantines, the Byzantines did not see this as a serious threat, and so it kind of caught them off guard. It was very much the same as America going to Vietnam, um, just running into something where you are not at all prepared for it. And so from 636 on, the Islamic conquests spread very very slowly in the Middle East. The Byzantines, after losing Jerusalem, kind of figured it out. They were like, wait a second, we just lost the entirety of you know, what used to be the Seleucid Empire. So they realized that was a problem. Uh, they had lost the entirety of North Africa. They, the um, the Europeans who were still in, and in, at that time, I believe it may have even been Byzantine rule in some places, but the Europeans in Spain, the Christians in Spain, had been driven north. And in 732 AD, you get the Battle of Tours, which is actually in, like, central France. Uh, you have Islamic armies come up, Moorish armies, and they face they face off in this very climactic battle between the French and the Moors, the Franks and the Moors. And this is pre Charlemagne. This is Charles Martel, who's Charlemagne's grandfather, I believe. Um, and there's this huge climactic battle in 732. The Franks defeat the Moors, and that kind of stops the expansion. And then for the next 300 years, over in the East, in the Middle East, you have the Turks convert to Christianity, and between the Turks. And the Arabs, the the Byzantines were having a very, very, very difficult time securing their own territory. So after the Battle of Manzikert in the 1070s, when the Byzantines lose a whole bunch more territory, they finally reach out, and this is all after the schism, they finally reach out to the Catholic Church and say, hey, we need your help. If you do not help us out right now, we are going to lose all of Byzantium to the Muslims. Uh, and the church went, okay, the Catholics went, okay, we're, we'll help. Uh, and so they went to everybody and they said, hey, guys, um, the Roman Empire really needs our help. The Byzantines need our help. Will you come with us? And the entirety of Europe just kind of goes, nah, I got my own problems. So he then sends another you know, letter around. He's like, hey, what if we help the Byzantines and take Jerusalem? And that gets everyone spurred into into action. You know, let's go. And then you get 200 years of crusades. So the, the first crusade, justified. 
just in terms of socioeconomic and, you know, uh, ge geopolitical reasons, what you're looking at here is a completely justified war between two powers. And it's not, it is not the initiation of aggression that it's often taught as. What it was is a response to 400 years of expansion by the Arabs and the Moors. So, yes, religion is kind of used as the reason to spur people into it at the time, but looking back at it through a historical lens, what you're dealing with is really not a religious war. It is a war between two very different cultural groups trying to maintain control, and, you know, the, the crusade for Jerusalem was just a piece of trying to keep the Islamic world at bay. So it's it's as much a cultural issue and a geographical issue as it is a political or a religious issue, in my opinion. Well, I'll let you cover that. Very yeah. nice. <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know if you have thoughts on the concept of just war from a religious standpoint that you want to talk about, but um, it's the thing. Uh, I am not a fan of. It's the word government. <laughs> um, no, more specifically, uh, it talks. It talks throughout the Bible. Any institution of man, any, will eventually turn corrupt. Mm -hmm. It will eventually turn into itself, do wicked things. Right. That include, and this is why, like, Catholic people disagree with me, but I don't care. That includes the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm includes and i know like things can be ordained by god and have god as the figurehead but if god's not the figurehead that's where problems come mm -hmm. that's uh any world government that's any what have you so whenever you have a group of people who are um pushing their own agenda and using god as a shield to do it mm -hmm. it's a very bad awful place to be in as a matter of fact it talks about how in the how uh, on judgment day there's several people who come before the throne of god and did they not prophesy and do things in his name? And God says, depart from me, thy wicked servant. I never knew you. Mm -hmm. You do not want God to say No, you do you. not. Uh, that, that's so kind of like the only thing throughout the Bible that gets you removed from, from heaven, that gets you removed from eternal salvation is blasphemy. Non-belief and, bla yeah, non and blasphemy. Like, those are the big no-nos. Yeah. Blasphemy and, is the uh, only one that gets you, like, you're in the book of life. Blasphemy gets you pulled out of the book of life. I... <sighs> That's what it says in Revelation, at least. That's that's what I'm yes. going with. Like, yeah. there's a very direct yeah, quote right. in Revelation where it's, you know, essentially, if you change this book, you're going to hell. Blotted out, yeah. Yeah. Um, it's, I won't get into that right now. But anyway, um, so there's several people who tout the flag of God mm. in order to further their own agenda. Um, and uh, things don't go well for them. No, but, they do not. Uh, when it, but uh, I cannot think of a war was not direct defense or ordainment by god something like old testament like you know joshua and stuff I cannot think of a war that's good now god talks in the new testament about how men should prepare for war because they're wickedness and evil but that's not him saying war is good yeah that's him saying don't die when they happen it's basically saying like, war is a reality be prepared for it pretty much yeah yeah it's, it's not like when the bible talks about death it's like oh so you're supposed to die no, like, <laughs> it's, yeah. uh, but but people will take that and they'll be like, oh well, there's wars in the Bible, so here we go, game time. <laughs> uh, you know, it's like like Aiden said, it's a reality. Yeah. Um. All right. I think I'm in the right spot with super chats. It did just make a bunch of them disappear, a bunch of chats. Uh. But I'll. There's a way to... View yeah, it's, it's, it, YouTube does not do the best thing here. But uh, Jaden Vitt for $5, his first ever Super Chat, something to you as I was trying to get into my faith, and if it wasn't for you and a few good friends, I probably wouldn't. So thank you. We are Aww. glad to hear that. That is, like, the best thing to hear. Yeah, that means a lot. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Problematic Farmer says her question wasn't answered, but I don't know which question it was. There's a lot of them in here. We're getting through them. <laughs> uh, ask it again by the yeah. time we're done. We'll see if it comes yeah. back around. You, you have my number. Text it to me. Um, I, that's one of my <laughs> Discord mods. Uh, uh, Sequitur Tenebris for $20, thank you, says, Can you all explain evil done in the name of God? Is it misunderstood in the scripture or something else, i.e. Westboro Baptist types? So I, I think that kind of plays into the, the last few things we said. Um, there is no evil in the name of God. There is only evil. And if you put it in the name of God, it compounds and gets more evil <laughs> yeah so it's it's kind of like a double helping you're doing one evil but putting god's name on evil is also evil so that's like a double order yeah. at once which can't be a good thing 
I, I would put it this but way: I, the the people, the folks over at Westboro Baptist Church are going to be uh, a, a lot lower on the heavenly totem pole than a gay Christian. Like, that's a gay Christian right. who loves everybody much better in God's eyes than Westboro Baptist Church. <laughs> I, I remember, um, I think it's Paul. I've, I've, sometimes I feel like I accidentally attribute everything to Paul, but he said a lot in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. Um, he, the most of the New Testament is Paul. <laughs> most of the New Testament is Paul. Yeah, so I'm pretty. It's a pretty safe bet. Like, ah, uh, Paul. Um, I, I think it's Romans. He's talking about the church was complaining about fellow people who are like wanting to fight or wanting to kill people in the name of mm. God, and Paul essentially says, "I fear the eternity that awaits those people." Yeah, that's so. That's not a good thing to have. Yeah. One of the oh. one of the most important apostles say to you, who who is yeah. Paul's uh, apostolic predecessor? You mean like which apostle did essentially ordained him? Out? It was Thomas, right? I think so, if I remember correctly. Yeah, just because uh, Christian the Catholics and Orthodox both have the concept of apostolic succession. Um, I think mm -hmm. Lutherans and Anglicans might as well, but. Um, Protestant churches typically don't in the United States. So that's something that a lot of people kind of like get, get fuzzy on, but yeah, that's a. Was him or. I mean, I can, I don't think it specifically says who made him an apostle. Someone brought him to the 12. Mm -hmm. I think it was Thomas. It could have been Matthew. I think it was yeah. Thomas. Anyway, I just did a study of X. I should know, but he was, was like baptized by Ananias. Yes, An Ananias is the one who dunked him yeah. and the scales came off of his eyes. Are you talking about who, like, was his religious leader? Because that would be Ananias. Yeah. But it was, um, I think, Thomas, who brought him to the Twelve, if you're talking about his joinment to the Apostles. Yeah. Is this the guy? He I was blind, he was... and then God comes to Ananias, and he's like, hey, you know that guy who's been killing Christians? I need you to go over to his house. Yeah. And Ananias is like, please don't do this. <laughs> <laughs> and, and God's like, you'll be fine. I'm God. Yeah, please so, stop. <laughs> please, you, God's like, really? <laughs> you're good. I, God's literally talking to this man, and he's like, really? You're afraid? Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but yet, God does it to us, and we're also uh, afraid. So I can't uh, say anything. All right. Um, um, Diego Flores for uh, PEN20. I don't know what PEN is. Um, but thank you. I don't know what currency that is. Uh, I'm just, now I'm like thinking about it. I'm like, what is this? Uh, thoughts on how Japanese media seems to understand the Old and New Testament more than current day Christians. <laughs> Many current day Christians. Uh, also, any conspiracy you would like to go in detail after 411? Um, man, those are those are big ones. Uh, I don't know much about <laughs> Japanese media. But from what I, what I do know, it seems like the, their source material for when they do address Judeo-Christian uh, stories is the is the Bible, and I think that that is the answer to your question. Is I would guarantee that most Christians you will meet have never read the Bible cover to cover. I, I don't know that I could give you a percentage, but probably the vast majority of them have not done that. Um, and of those who have done that, even fewer did it of their own volition rather than through Sunday school or church or something like that. Um, so a lot of Christians, I think, just. Uh, don't have don't have the understanding that people who read the book have so for example if you know if you're writing harry potter fan fiction and you didn't read harry potter you probably wouldn't come very close whereas if you did read it and you added a character and wrote a story about that character you you probably get it right sorry to use harry potter but isaiah yells at me every time i use lord of the rings um fair I just appreciate diversity <laughs> but yeah that's that's how i look at it is you know I, I think it's honestly that they're just using the source material whereas a lot of christians today are basically going off of what they learned uh you know off their internet or for you know hearing from their pastor which isn't necessarily bad it's just you know you you probably shouldn't go out and preach unless you've read the book agreed no. That idea to just start guessing, which again, as someone who's been in church his whole life, know plenty of people who have done just yep. that. Start like, oh, well, I think blah blah blah, and they're just off the mark. Yeah, I it's okay to story. say I don't know. 
if somebody asks you a question. That's, correct. That's acceptable. I can tell you story after story of legit pastors even who I've come across who are just literally wrong. Yep. Just factually incorrect. There's this one guy, uh, Greg have, like, Locke, I keep hearing about who is just very hateful. I've never actually seen his stuff, but just every every quote I hear, I'm just like, dude. <laughs> like, just what are, you, what are you doing? When, when did this become I, the religion of hate? <laughs> man, I don't understand. Like, I under... Okay, I understand the initial American Protestantism, sort of. Like, the... I understand where, like, righteous fury came mm -hmm. into it because the OGs... Were to, and I say OGs, oh, I mean like colonial preachers, yeah. were talking about how Christians had let themselves evolve into wickedness. Yeah. Okay, that is, understand what there'd be a righteous hatred there. Um, that's similar to Jesus driving the people out of the temple with a whip. Like, anger has its place. However, there's this awful idea with a lot of Christianity, specifically in like the Bible Belt, where all of it is full of anger and malice. And that is the worst approach you could possibly give to people who are just coming into the faith. Like, that, the only time Jesus used anger is when someone who was a part of religion or knew the scriptures was purposefully going against them. Um, not for people who just came into it or people who were questioning to learn. So those people tear me up. Yeah, I, I had a personal experience with this. Um, for those who don't know, when I was in college, I was a medieval studies major and a religious studies minor. Um, so I I was, at the time, as a senior, like, in, in class, in 400 level classes on, like, the cosmology of wisdom literature in the Bible. So I was, I was in it. I was, I was, you know, in depth. Um, and... One day, a group very much like the Westboro Baptist Church people with the, the God hates signs walking around out in front of the main building. And uh, there were people trying to argue with them, but they were majority not Christians. Uh, so they weren't they weren't making the right arguments to dismiss these people. Um, and then you had a couple Christians get involved. One person was a Catholic and they just called him a papist and told him that they didn't care what he had to say. One person was Orthodox, one person was Jewish, and they had an excuse for every single group. I'm a Methodist, so when I got up there, there was really no excuse. It was, all right, I'm not Catholic, I'm not Orthodox, I'm not Jewish, I'm a Protestant, just like you guys. Um, and it, it was just a, an hour-long argument on the street between me and these people where I'm like, I, I by the end of it, I was mad at Christians. <laughs> like, <laughs> and I was, I'm standing there as a Christian, like, arguing with these people, man, you guys are annoying, like. <laughs> Just, so I get it, but those those people are a greater threat to Christianity than just about anyone else because they make it seem like this hateful ideology, and and in reality they should just shut up. You know what? Those people are seen a lot throughout the Bible too, and when I've been doing my study of Acts, they come up a lot. Uh, I, I'm once again asking because I know we're going over the normal time we do. Are you good to go a bit I'm, longer? I'm good to go as long as you want right, to go. Cool. I might have to pee so, again, but <laughs> it's fine. Uh, in the me too. In the book of Acts, um, which for those that don't know, Acts is the early, early days of the Christian church. Acts of like, the apostles. Uh, the Acts of the apostles. Yeah. So you've got the Gospels, which is the life of Jesus, and then Acts. So it's what the Christian, the first Christians do beginning the church immediately after jesus shortly after chapter six if i remember correctly or seven i just did study on this uh chapter five in acts chapter five there are two people named ananias and sapphira so the when i say the church is small i mean the entirety of christianity at this point is like a few hundred people like that, that's it so like the church is in a very sensitive period imagine because at the time the roman government was hunting down christians imagine if roman soldiers found 300 meeting together at once that would literally be the end mm -hmm. of christianity for all of human history right so it cannot be at a more sensitive point and during this two members of the church named ananias and sapphira begin to hide tithe money from them so, for those that don't know, the reason people tithe is because Christian work needs to continue. Money is a thing that exists. You need money to, like, travel or 
build or what have you. So the initial church is doing it so they can afford to send missionaries out, which mm -hmm. eventually becomes like Paul and Peter and all of them. So Ananias and Sapphira start to hide that money to themselves. Uh, they're told to give a portion of it back and they don't. So when Peter confronts them, he goes to Ananias first. And he says, where's the money? And Ananias is like, I'm not hiding it. Peter goes, you're dead. And he falls over dead immediately. Then Sapphira shows up. And Sapphira was uh, Ananias' wife. Mm -hmm. So he goes to Sapphira. He's like, where's, uh, I, I don't want to misquote this. Um, let me get it exactly. It says, um, is it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not thine own power? This is what Peter's saying to Ananias. It says, thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. Mm -hmm. Like this is sensitive time for the church. And he's lying to God it says, and Ananias hearing these words fell down and gave up the ghost. And great mm -hmm. fear came on all them that heard these things. It says, and the young men arose, wound him up and carried him out and buried him. It was about the space of three hours after and his wife, not knowing what was done, came in. So she's walking into the church now, does not know that her husband's dead. It says, and Peter answered unto her, tell me whether ye sold the land for so much. It's more specifically than just hiding money. Mm -hmm. They were supposed to sell one of the church members land to give the money to the church and they kept the money. Mm -hmm. so, or they lied about how much it sold for. But then... Uh, Peter says, uh, you sold the land for how much? And she said, yay, for so much. So she's like, yeah, the amount we gave, that's how much we sold it for. This, then Peter said unto her, how is it that ye have agreed together to tempt the spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of them which have buried thy husband are at the door and shall carry thee out. And fell she down straightway at his feet and yielded up the ghost. Wow. The young men came in and found her dead and carried her forth, burying her by her husband. Uh, <laughs> but I, one, I think it's important to talk about what the sin there is correct it yep. was it, it was it was the lie <laughs> correct it was the lie so if this was and to clarify if this was someone who didn't know god or even if someone who did know god it's the sin is not <clears throat> like oh they were not being completely truthful about how much money they have it's the fact that Ananias and Sapphira were the founders of the church. They had to be more about it because at such a crucial time, if anything goes wrong, the whole church falls apart. What if this new religion just got the testimony, oh, those are the that's the church whose member, that new religion starting up is the one whose members have been stealing money from landowners, right? Destroys Christianity for all of history. At such a sensitive time, you cannot have people with a bad testimony. And above all else, they knew better. They knew the position and the situation that they had. So whenever they are threatening the entire future of Christianity, there's no suffering, there's no penance. It's just you're out of the you're out of the equation. And I, I think the I, I, I talk yeah, good. I talk I talk about a lot to my class. If as a Christian, again, this doesn't apply to people who don't you know know mm -hmm. or follow God. As a Christian, if you you can either be in God's will or in the way of God's will. If you're in the way, you will promptly be removed mm -hmm. from uh, the will of God. And sometimes it can be good or sometimes yeah. fall down. I, I, do, I do like the message of Peter being like, uh, well, the men who carried your husband are at the door and you're going out. Yeah. You know? yeah. Like, that, no time to mess around. I, and I think that, you know, you really need to understand – Again, for people who are you know new to new to understanding Christianity, or maybe even just you know have have not heard this before, it's what, what's going on with cases like this is not that these people are you know just themselves a problem like 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 you said, it's it's that they are supposed to be the leaders and everything. So if they go astray, everyone in their church is also going astray. So they're not just you know, they are not only the keepers of their own souls, they are the keepers of the souls of an entire community. So if they lead those people astray, they are harming others actively. So by lying in such a manner, when you're in charge, when you've been given charge of a church, that's that's really bad. Um, like, for example, one person that, you know, I again, I'm not sure I believe in the idea of eternal hellfire for sinners, but uh, one person who I believe still is probably working his way back out of the, the pit is I, uh, um, Gregory the Seventh, the the Pope who issued the Dictatus Pape that argued that uh, the Catholic Pope is the supreme ruler of the entire world, uh, ordained by God for that. I think that that probably lost him some points. 
Um, to answer the other half of the question, uh, also any conspiracy you would like to go in detail after 411? Uh, yes. <laughs> um, and it's something that might get me killed. Um, so I might not do it. Uh, <laughs> That's the best guy. You know Bohemian Grove? Bohemian Club? <laughs> Bro, if you get assassinated for Bohemian Grove, I will name my child after you. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> but yeah, I've, I've looked at that and I'm like, hmm, I'd love to figure out what's going on here. Uh, but yeah. I haven't killed Alex Jones yet, so you'll be Exactly. Uh, Just pretend to be crazy at the same time. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I might not have to pretend at this point. They might be like, ah, this guy thinks, <laughs> this guy believes in the Wendigo. We don't need to worry about him. Um, uh, Jack Mance for $5. Uh, do you think, oh, okay, it was just a re-upping that question. Yes, I do. Um, the, the first few, the, the rest were a little bit like, okay, you, you guys are done. You, you failed. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, Space Panda for two dollars says, uh, "Yes, Ray, Target, Target. We do have a brand. We we have a brand ambassadorship with Target. Uh, if you go to the the link in our description and, and buy stuff, we will make small amount of money. And what I'm wearing is from Target. It's a very very comfortable shirt by a good fellow and co. Uh, Space Panda for two dollars said, "Have you had supernatural experiences with God? I personally would not say I've ever had a supernatural experience that I would chalk up to speaking directly with God. I have had some weird experiences, but nothing on that level." Um, I wouldn't call it, it's a lot for a person to be like, oh yeah, God talked to me, right? But I do believe God speaks in a still small voice, mm -hmm. um, or like through a spiritual life. I remember when I was, I was really close with my grandfather, uh, when he died, I was 10 years old and his death really tore me up. Then the night he died, uh, I had a dream where, uh, I talked to him mm -hmm. and, um, I asked him questions that I don't think at 10 years old, my brain would have like, you know, obviously dreams, you can talk to your yeah. subconscious or whatever. Um, it's enough faith for me, the conversation we had, that it wasn't just a, like, you know, my brain overlapping the mm -hmm. chemicals to feel like I felt like it was a supernatural experience. That's not even to say that I spoke to him necessarily because I don't, I believe to be absent with the bodies to be present with the Lord as a child. I feel like situations like that were divine mm -hmm. in order to give me a better understanding or a better fulfillment. Not to say that God directly came down and talked to me or the spirit of my grandfather shot out of heaven yeah. into, you know, whatever. But um, it is it is enough to, like, help my faith. Yeah. Uh, I've had situations similar to that. Uh, I remember one night, this sounds really weird. I'm not saying this to say that I am like a, uh, what, what's the word? Not prophet? psychic, uh, medium. Not a prophet, not a medium. I don't believe in any of those in the modern age. I don't believe mm -hmm. that post Christ there's any like true prophets uh, or anything like that. Um, I, I think it was just a weird occurrence that some people chalk up to supernatural. I don't necessarily. I had a dream that my neighbor was going to die, mm -hmm. and then the next day he did. Uh huh. Um, that was weird because <laughs> it, it was like it was someone I had it. It's someone I didn't. It, it turns out they were sick. I didn't know they were sick hadn't spoken to him in years then um uh, i just walked in i was like 12 and i walked into my room and was like i had a dream that so and so died and my parents were like huh an hour later they're like uh okay. <laughs> something happened so uh, uh other aiden has told a story on on our show before where i believe it was his grandmother um he just woke up one night and went and asked his parents like how she was doing or something or some i can't remember the story you know i'll ask him to tell it next time he's on um, but basically like he, he just knew when she died. Um, and for me, I, my grandfather died in December. Um, and I remember, you know, we, we knew that he was declining pretty, pretty fast, but I remember on a few occasions saying to my cousins, saying to my mom, um, he's waiting for Christmas. He's going to go on Christmas. Um, and uh, I got this this tattoo that I have actually I got in uh, in November around Thanksgiving week of Thanksgiving it, it means I am not afraid I uh, but it, and I got it you know because I knew he was dying and I just remember kind of like ha just being sure of that like it wasn't even, a lot of people in my family were like ah oh, you know maybe and I, I was just positive 100% I was like he is going to die he's he is waiting for us to all be together for Christmas sure enough we finished dinner on Christmas Day, 
and immediately after everybody finished and cleaned up, we all got the call. Um, we were all we were all at my aunt's place. Uh, one of my older cousins was the one who delivered the news because uh, his his kids, his my mom and her siblings were all with him, and then the rest of the family was over at our aunt's house uh, a mile away, and it was just kind of like when, when it happened, I I just. I was kind of at peace with it because I knew it was happening. Um, and that's probably the closest I've ever come. Um, but yeah, it's, it's sometimes stuff just happens where like you just, you know, and you can't explain why. It's just, you're, you're positive of it. And it, it, I think th those kinds of things are in a way God speaking to you, but not through words in a way that you would necessarily recognize in the moment. Yeah. Um, I, I'm very cautious of anyone who says God directly speaks to yeah. them because biblically that's not how it works. Uh, but I do believe that God speaks through the Spirit. He speaks yeah. through a small voice. That's the whole purpose of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. We have a piece of God in us as believers um, that communicates right from wrong and all that. So it's one of those things that I can't really like give you a direct experience to be like, oh, yeah, this is the time God spoke to me. But I feel throughout my life he speaks to me in different ways. Yeah. Um, without being a weird zealot. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's a little the hints here and there you're not you're not yeah, experiencing I don't, I don't like a voice voices. in your head yeah yeah i don't hear voices call um, the sixth sense if you will yeah. if, if you do hear voices it might be schizophrenia um <laughs> to, if we get that checked out yeah. uh, uh no dancing palm trees for seven dollars canadian says thank you for this episode on job and for all of your related tangents as a Taoist, i appreciate your knowledge that you share with us well thank you i haven't met many Taoists hmm. in my life um but it's I, I appreciate the uh, the ideology. We learned about it in college. Um, Greg Torres for five dollars says, "What is y'all's favorite game?" Video game. Yeah, I assume video game. Um, I've been playing Hell Let Loose a lot lately because I love World War II games. That's been my favorite game right now. I'm try that like later. my favorite. It's so good, man. It's so good. Like. Do you want to talk about realism World War II? Especially whenever you start playing as an officer, calling in artillery, designating tanks and soldiers. Oh, it's so fun. Anyway, that's my favorite game right now. Uh, my favorite game of all time is... I always have good answers for this whenever I'm not asked them. I always said the Batman Arkham games because I grew up on them, and they were mm -hmm. like... Oh, uh, the, Resident, the new Resident Evil games are my gotcha. favorite by far. So like Resident Evil 7, Resident Evil 8, RE2 remake, those are my favorite. I'm so stoked for the RE4 remake. So, yeah. I think my favorite of all time would be Mountain Blade Bannerlord. Um that's just probably the one that I've I, I think if I look at Steam, I've probably logged 5000 hours on it. Um a, a lot of those have been just from it sitting idle or something, but like sure. En en enough <laughs> enough or not from that. Um but yeah, it's I, I think that one and I uh, also up there, Age of Empires 2. Um, you know, that's that's the first video game I ever really played. My dad and I played it all the time. Um, I finally beat him for the first time in my life when I was 20. Wow. Yeah. Congratulations. It took me, it took me, he introduced me to that game when I was three. It took me 17 years to beat him. But I did it. <laughs> but I did it, dad. Um, let's see what else do we have in here. Uh, <clears throat> Christian Castro. For 20 asked uh hey guys love your content hope you're having a good day i was born and raised as a mormon and i know that my religion is usually a joke but i still have i still believe to be a faithful son of god that's I, honestly that's all that matters about it um mormonism definitely does get uh, a lot of a lot of flack um you know i i have my issues with uh with certain aspects of it but at the same time if people as long as you're being a good person as long as you're trying to be christ-like that's that's what's charged to you as a christian um my, i mean my main issue with it is the denial of the trinity uh but you know as long as you're doing as long as you're trying to be a good person that's the goal you know i like those subtle jabs you got in there it wasn't really a jab it's just that that's that's why yeah. i don't consider it christian yeah. is is that christianity acknowledges the trinity so you know when i say mormons aren't christian it's not it's not me saying like you know you're a bad person it's me saying like there, there's a there is a significant difference in ideology yeah. between these two faiths people are calling me based i'm still scrolling through looking for questions people are calling me based and i don't know what i did to deserve it but thank you might have been the government <laughs> comment <laughs> yeah that's probably what it was <laughs> i don't like uh government yeah okay 
Uh, Surfing Cowboy for five says, I appreciate that your brother's in Christ. It makes mysterious folklore discussions grounded and comfy rather than devolving into schizo posting. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. Thank you. I appreciate yeah. that. Um, let's see. Uh, Hammond for $2 just says, when to bussy. So, um, I saw that. I was hoping you'd ignore it. I, it was a super chat. I, I, we have rules when, on this when channel. Go, when to bussy was bad enough. Yeah. Pussy makes me want to kill myself. <laughs> if it makes you feel any better, Thornberry is Thorn Pussy. Like, Let's keep reading. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Echelon Lazarus for 20 says, I just got here in more ways than one. Uh, I couldn't think of a question, but keep up the good work. You guys are awesome. Thank you. I appreciate that. If it makes you feel any better, uh, Lanago Miscellaneous says no at Hammond. What, the wind of Pussy? Yeah, thing? yeah. Thank you for that for defending my honor somewhat. In, in the future i will not acknowledge i hate that you came up with that it drives me crazy <laughs> no you can acknowledge it because it's your thing but like i got so many windigussy comments did you actually yes back okay. whenever that was like they might was not have been my fault yeah but then i go over to tiktok and you're just like oh windigussy windigussy uh, 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 no i said when dussy that's what i meant when dussy whatever <laughs> Whatever you did, that that, came that back it on was me. not intentional. I will say that much. That, that, like I, I was, I was just strolling through my comments like these heathens. I can't stand them. Then I go over to my friend and podcast host, and he's like, "Oh, when does it?" And, for yeah. a while, I did fight it. I okay. finally broke in February and just went with the meme. Um, yeah, well, that's when they got bad. So yeah, thank you. That was my bad. Um, I have seen people that don't even follow me making videos about the windowsy now. So. Um, yeah. I have lost control. Do you ever think God too looks down at his creations? <laughs> Stop. <laughs> I love that. That's a quote from spy kids. I'm sure it's I from know, something know, else, I but know. just like the Steve Buscemi saying, do you think God too lives in fear of what he's created is just like a fever dream moment from childhood. Uh, Aiden Paladin for 10 says on Judas, God required him to betray Christ. So is Judas saved for going through with God's plan? That's a solid question, actually. Say that again. Uh, Judas, God, God needed Judas to betray Christ for Christ's sacrifice to occur. Oh, the whole Judas's destiny. Yeah. Thing. Covered this on the Bible theory iceberg. So my interpretation of it goes back to the same argument that god saw throughout history for example uh it talks about i'm, I'm taking it away from judas so that i can then relate it back mm -hmm. to judas it talks about in the old testament specifically in the book of isaiah at um jesus the son of man uh the christ whenever he comes to earth that he will never break a bone in his body uh, one of the method, one of the ways that people are killed during a crucifixion is their leg is broken. Mm -hmm. For those that don't know, one the, the reason a crucifixion is fatal is because you suffocate. Yeah. It's a very excruciating death. You suffocate because your arms are up like this, and your all your weights hanging like on your mm -hmm. hands and you're stretched. So you can only do short breaths, and the only way you can get a breath is if you stand up by pushing off your legs mm -hmm. so that you can breathe and then set back down. So the way that they speed up executions is they break your leg so that when you can't push up, so you suffocate quicker. Horrific death. Uh, whenever G it, it, So it says in the book of Isaiah that Jesus would never break a bone, right? Mm -hmm. um, then we get to the crucifixion, and it's like, oh, his bone should be broken. But it says that whenever the soldier was breaking the bone of the two other men on the cross, he comes to Jesus, and it seems that Jesus was already dead, so he didn't break his bone. Mm -hmm also says that one of the prophecies is that he will be stabbed in his side so the soldier at the bottom of the cross checking to see if he's dead stabs jesus in the side with a spear mm -hmm. and it says blood and water pours out um so did that soldier have a destiny or a faith no i wouldn't say so mm -hmm. the guy was just doing his job and he's like oh this one's dead let me check and he stabs him it's not like that soldier was I mean, you could say in a theoretical sense, but it's not like his purpose was was predestined mm -hmm. to carry out that. It's just that God, who can see all of time, 
gave knowledge to people in the past to predict it so that his word could further be glorified and that proof of God could further stand. Because there's no way that you could say the prophet Isaiah knew that Jesus Christ would not have his leg broken in yeah. some fluke of crucifixion. I, I mean, it's again another proof. Yeah, cru crucifixion wasn't even a common punishment at Isaiah's time. Correct, yeah. And like, he talked about how the Son of Man would be hung on a tree, and people were like, okay, whatever that means. He was quite <laughs> literally the, hung on <laughs> But wood. he was quite like, literally hung on a tree, yeah. Um, like, there's so... that, And, like, you can get into the prophecies. There's so many of those. But it's not like people who set those up were like oh i'm carrying out my destiny it's just that god had knowledge of the future mm -hmm. so he gave it to men in the past judas is one of those mm -hmm. uh, it talks about how a spirit came into judas or like wickedness essentially came over him and he was following his own evil he regretted it afterwards mm -hmm. but in the time he was following his own wicked deceit he was like ah, i don't want to be around this jesus mm -hmm. guy and they'll give me some money to betray him he betrays god isn't something that god bestowed on him or put like a cap over him mm -hmm. that he was supposed to do that was something that was going to happen so god gave the knowledge to isaiah just as he gave the knowledge of being stabbed in the side that uh he would be betrayed by someone close to him mm -hmm. but it's not like isaiah writing it sealed judas's destiny it's god just saw everything before it happened which leads to another level because um peter talked about after jesus died he was like, it was even said that the Son of Man would betray him. See, because Peter knew the scripture. He mm -hmm. understood it. Judas was next to it his whole life. Imagine Judas. He's standing next to Christ. He knows that this guy's been written about by the prophet Isaiah and everyone who came before him. And he may have read that someone will rise up and betray him. But he was so narrow-minded or so pointed away from the scripture that he didn't think anything of it when he betrayed him. Yeah about that you're reading about a guy who's like he will be betrayed before he dies and rises again and you're betraying him and that just does not click the wires in your brain whereas with peter he mentioned it he was like it said he would be betrayed and sure enough he was betrayed so that gives you an idea of judas's state of mind he wasn't even conscious of it so it's not like judas was possessed by the holy spirit or something he acted in his own will god just gave knowledge of it to people in the past agreed and also got to remember that, that a big you know through point of all of this is that the devil exists and is temptation constantly like so even if you are a righteous person the devil might come to you and suggest things to you and it might be that it could be as as blatant as you know someone appearing to you and saying do this thing or it could just be those intrusive thoughts you know um it's a, and like people get discouraged a lot of the times this is especially like a thing with like some pentecostal uh, not pentecostal some like uh uh the word i'm looking for bible belt uh evangelical uh, yes thank you yes yeah, especially in like a lot of evangelical religion of uh, christianity like they'll say that like thoughts or concepts are wrong but that's not how it is like temptation's not a sin dwelling on temptation is a sin uh, for example if a guy like sees a woman and thinks she's pretty mm -hmm. that's not a sin it's not a sin to just be like i am man you are woman cute uh, it is however a sin to continuously think on it yeah. into it says it says if a man ponders on a woman's figure that he's committed adultery with her in his heart to have wicked and immoral thoughts about a woman that's a sin it's not a sin to think a girl's pretty yeah exactly um the same, the same can apply to like disbelief it's not a sin to be like oh well what did god mean by this as a christian especially growing up in church i had points where i was like i wonder if god's real i wonder if this is what god and every time i searched the scriptures you know god held up to the criticism i had or the questions i had more specifically um but like it's not it's not a sin to think wrong i mean we just talked about job who wanted to commit suicide yep not a, a sin, sin. <laughs> Not a sin. Actually, yeah. just a completely understandable thought during you know, the yeah, yeah. being human. Jesus, Jesus was tempted. The devil dragged Jesus into the wilderness for 40 days and tried to convince him to give up his empire or to show his power and all this other stuff. And it says Jesus was tempted. Mm -hmm. So if that guy can, who are we to be like, oh, I, I shouldn't have a bad thought. Like, yeah, are you, just ridiculous. you're not better than God. Yeah. To, like you're going to have a bad control. thought. It's going to happen. Right. Um, human that's how it works <laughs> uh bullwhip bobby love which is one hell of a name let me just say uh, <laughs> that's a great name. for four dollars and 20 cents uh says do y'all see marijuana on the same level as wine um i i assume you mean in terms of like the sin of drunkenness in which case uh, i i think that the sin really is inebriation um and excessive inebriation um i i don't think god's up there 
looking at you for smoking a joint to deal with your anxiety and deciding that you're going to hell. I, um, unless it's like a close friend wants my counseling, I do not comment on anything that could be a personal yeah. step. Right? <laughs> like I, what I will comment on is things that bring other people down, you know, thievery, I, I will openly say, fellas, it's bad to make a woman uncomfortable. Yeah. I'll openly say, uh, ladies, it's bad to manipulate men. You know, like, even though those are personal decisions you're making, there's something that affects someone else. Yeah. That's where, like, the call out of sin. But if it's something that, like, I will say it's definitely bad to force any, like, I don't partake in any substances out mm -hmm. of personal conviction. I'm not going to expect everyone to hold to that yeah. same standard. Um because that's a personal standard. It doesn't hurt anyone else. Now, if you're hurting someone else with it, stop. Um, aside from that, like read the scriptures and come to your own determination of it. Yeah. I think at the end of the day, it, it a lot of it depends on why you're doing it as well. Um, you know, drinking wine for the Eucharist is very different than drinking wine because you're watching, you know, New Girl. And it's just, you decided to <laughs> drink wine. Like, so, you know, if you're, if you're using... Like, my opinion on it would be, like, if you're using marijuana because it's a good sleep aid or something like that and you have insomnia brought on by something, like, that's, you know, for me, I use CBD to fight my uh, my insomnia that I have for my anxiety disorder. So I don't think that God's up there looking at me, you know, popping a CBD gummy and going, ah. I, I think it's, you know, if I were to sit there and, you know, smoke uh... smoke 10 <laughs> joints, eat an edible and, you know, drink some weed infused coffee i think at that point god would be like hey hey my, my guy like it it does talk about dulling your mind yeah. it, it talks about how it's bad as, again these are stuff for as a believer as yeah. a christian it's bad to like numb yourself to the world to not be able to be an active participant it's like in the spirit of sloth slothfulness isn't good um it's essentially along the same line of being lazy it also talks about how it's not good to owe any debts or debtors to people or things so if you have an addiction to something and that's what controls you that in itself is a departure from what god wants because you know you're supposed to be your own free agent not been to the will of something that a substance you can't get over exactly uh, and again that's not a sin that hurts someone else it's sinful or wrong because it hurts you the person um, so. yeah exactly exactly my opinion on the subject um what else do we have? Uh, we have from Echelon Lazarus again for five. Just a thought of a question. Uh, I was wondering where I can listen to Wendigoon's old Patreon podcast. So the old Patreon podcast is currently dead with Patreon. I don't want to like set up a site or something just for it. I will probably be starting a different podcast in a similar vein soon-ish. And once that's done, I'll figure out what I want to do with it. All the old episodes are still saved go somewhere eventually but for now i'm focusing on future direction then after that's done i'll see if i can like offload the old ones or something we'll see if if you want to put them on a website i have a template i can give you that you can just throw them on oh okay yeah then we may do that yeah. you'll you'll be the first to know if you follow me on twitter and yeah. stuff so um I, I can help you the website design is what i do um so uh what was i looking for right there we go um scrolling back down back down back down uh, Milena for 499 says it makes me happy that there's Christian creators out there like you two. Keep it up, champs. Also, Isaiah is really hot. <laughs> I'm sure my girlfriend uh, hopefully would agree with you. Uh, but that's Based on her Twitter, I would say probably. Hopefully, yeah. I, I do follow her on Twitter. She's a very, very devoted girlfriend. <laughs> yes, I'm very happy to be with her. Um, let's see. Eric for $2 says great work, guys. Loving the channels and content. Thank you, Eric. Um, Somebody said the Crusades is a long story, and I agree with that take. <laughs> there, there is a great book that I have that I, uh, I will find and I will, I will post it somewhere um, about the Crusades and just a very good. Uh, it's just it's it's one of those books that like yeah it's nonfiction but it reads like a novel so it's a just really great one. Um, what else do we got here? Scrolling down. Damn, 260 watching, 200, uh, 230 likes. What a ratio. We're actually at 327 watching and 320 likes right now. So uh, I appreciate you guys. You are, oh, are fantastic. Yeah, you are the best. Um, uh, Gun Day for $5 uh, asks, what's your favorite handgun and rifle? 
not show and tell. I'm fine with it. Get to, get to another question while I'm grabbing these. Okay. Um, I mean, I can give my answer. Uh, I, I have a Ruger AR-556, and I love it. Um, but I've also uh, always wanted a Springfield 1903. Um, I just want one really bad. I can't really explain why other than that. I just I, I just love them. Um, I love bolt-action rifles. I think they're a lot of fun to shoot. Um, as far as handguns go, I would love to have a 1911 one day. Um, but I... I went with a 40 cal uh, Smith & Wesson M&P Shield 2.0. Um, it's pretty heavy and kind of bulky, not a good concealed carry, but as far as a self-defense weapon goes, it's awesome. Uh, great magazine capacity and um, really good weight uh, to help with the recoil. Uh uh let's see uh oh boy we skipped ahead a little bit um well while, while he handles his his business over there uh if lucifer asked god to be forgiven with sincerity do you think he would be forgiven or has he done too much evil to be forgiven that's a wow that's a really good question what I missed. um the, the just the next question uh is is a great one but if you're if you're prepared for your answer to the favorite handgun yeah, I'll, go, I'll go ahead and uh do that we're just having fun at this. I, point. Yeah, I said my I my nine. Board. I said my nineteen oh three and uh, or I said I want a nineteen oh three and I would also love my uh, I love my Smith and Wesson. Springfield nineteen oh three. Yeah, I just want one. <laughs> They're I have one. They are very fun. It's just I just bolt love action. bolt action rifles. They're fine. I want a mar I want a infield really bad. I'm looking Same. for one right now. I saw a, uh, a replica, <laughs> um, in a gun shop in New York, and it uh, it was it was a. Five hundred dollar Enfield, and I was like, mm. <laughs> uh, and those are nice. Anyway, so handgun. Uh, I don't do a lot of competition shooting, but when I do, this is like the smoothest firing. Just uh, a CZ seventy five. Uh, this is specifically the Shadow two, so it's like the thin grip one. This is the most accurate handgun I've ever shot. Not only in shot for shot, but like the recoil is invisible it's fantastic it's 21 round magazine like it's absurd is it a nine uh, mil i like this thing a lot yeah it's nine mil uh, with these extensions is actually 23 so yeah, it's fun uh it's a good target pistol mm -hmm. my favorite single rifle I go to of ar is a knight's armament sr15 with a variable this is like Appalachia stand gun, <laughs> <laughs> a 16 inch variable optic. Oh my uh, god! And it and it's a knight, so yeah. Sitting uh, here with my now. much cheaper Ruger. <laughs> <laughs> and my fa my favorite model of rifle, however, is the FAL. Uh, oh my god! You have an FAL. I've got. I am several. jealous. Because a few years ago, my dad and I got into building them, uh -huh. and we still do. So I'll buy the parts kits cheap. And then like get receivers imported mm -hmm. and my dad and i will build them out so this was the so first cool. one we built uh, it's a south american foul um but yeah like the design is fantastic i still think it's the best 308 semi-automatic design ever um and it's like you can excellently tune the gas on it to where it's a smooth shooter uh, and they're accurate and i like them a lot so yeah damn i'm i'm jealous of your your stash <laughs> thank you um, i'm also jealous of the stash i wish i could grow facial hair <laughs> before the show um, i was sitting in my bathroom like do i do i shave or do i keep this this mess of of scraggly hair on my face <laughs> but yeah the, did we what, go ahead i was gonna say did we skip through a lot of the oh no a lot of the, that one no that's of the super chats oh okay i don't right. think so i mean not any that i saw okay. on my my screen um okay See, uh, if Lucifer asked God to be forgiven with sincerity, do you think he would be forgiven, or has he done too much evil to be forgiven? I think Lucifer's fate is kind of already sealed. Uh, I think is being... Uh, that, to me, is almost the same question as what if there's, like, multiple, like, generations of humanity that exists. Yeah. Like, one of those unknowables. I feel like... Lucifer's pretty determined given that he not only led the rebellion against God, but led humanity itself to plunge into eternal damnation. Do, uh, are, are, separation we, from God. are we in agreement that the Satan in Revelation is Lucifer, same person? 
yeah, 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 okay. yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I, I mean, if you read Revelation, one, one of the only things about Revelation that is very, very explicit is that Lucifer and the rebellious angels get cast into eternity. Um, basically, everything else is up for interpretation, which is why it's such a hard book to talk about. But, uh, you know, you get you get a pretty pretty explicit thing that says, you know, God is going to win and everybody's going to get cast into eternity who, who fought against him, all the angels. So, I mean, I... And the question is, like, where are we in that timeline with Revelation? Um, you know, it was, again, I spent an entire course on this uh, in college and still don't totally understand it. But it was basically, like, there's there's a few possibilities. One is that all of the stuff in Revelation has yet to occur, that it's in the future. There's one belief that it already occurred. And then there's the, uh, the, the more kind of the general consensus one is that we are living in it. Um, and the things that are written about in Revelation are coming to pass but that the timeline is totally unknowable and we could get, you know, a number of things happen and then nothing else happens that's supposed to happen for several hundred years. And, you know, that's why, that's why when you read Revelation and you have all these people who are coming out and, you know, having these doomsday prophecies and whatnot, like, it's just, it, it's just because a series of things that happen in Revelation happen or seem like they happen does not mean that we're looking at the end of the world in, you know, next month. Uh, so don't take doomsday prophecies to heart. They're not accurate ever mm -hmm. um you look you look disgruntled no i'm, I'm literally just oh, you're just reading chat, is this just yeah, your yeah, reading I, face I, I <laughs> yeah. um, just a general upsetness uh, now uh yeah. should i feel obligated jack man said should i feel obligated to try and convert my pagan friend um my opinion on that would be that you should make it clear that you are happy to talk to them about christianity at any time but that's about where it should stop. Um, you do not want to force it onto them. You want to let them know that you're there, that you're a resource. But if it is their choice not to, then, you know, it, it's not something where you should end the friendship. It's not something where you should push them until they end the friendship. Be a resource. Give them, tell them that you're happy to spread spread the word, but you don't want to force it. And, it, and you don't even need to phrase it like a... a um, conversion deal just if it's just you know like you know I know you're pagan just so you know um, I'd love to talk about faith and religion if you ever want to have a discussion you can ask me questions I you know I'm just here that's that is the best way to approach that kind of thing in my opinion is that yeah. just oh, not we're, we're, yeah I was just uh, waiting no 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 no, no. <laughs> no 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 yeah you're right um, my <laughs> know why i thought that was like i was like okay next question uh yeah um in my experience uh this scene to friends can be tricky uh, because you know there's like a there's a bond there and you don't want to jeopardize it in any way but at the same time like you know if you know about eternal salvation and the love of christ you would want to share that with a friend um in my experience i've never like guess rushed a friend with it never been like hey let me you know tell you about blah 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 because that rare that doesn't work in my experience at least most scenarios obviously there's some where it would uh and that's up to you some people are just desperate to, yeah. for something and if you give them that it'll go a long way but in my experience um all my friends know i'm a christian i try to live a lifestyle that's conducive of that at least I, i'm not perfect mm -hmm. by any means but at least to where it's known um and most often, my friends who are lost have come to me. They've come, and I've had the privilege of leading several of my friends to God just from me being a resource that whenever something happens, they're just like, why do you believe the things you do? Or how do you know this? Uh, and from there, I don't. it's not like I'm forcing myself on them. I have the opportunity to tell a friend about something that means a lot to me. And whenever they trust in that, that's you know, a blessing that words can't get into. Yeah. I, I very recently words. had a real life experience of this with one of my friends who I've known since I was seven, um, where we were just sitting talking about current events and everything. Um, and he was, he made some comments about religion and Christianity and all of that. And I just kind of sat there and asked him, you know, why he, why he thinks those things. And like, you know, you know, what are, what are his questions for me as a Christian, you know, about why I believe what I believe. And for what I did was I sat there, I explained it. And when, you know, at a certain point, it just became clear that he was, like, just not not responding to it. Um, 
you know, either because he wasn't prepared to really have the conversation with himself or just because he, you know, didn't want to argue about it or whatever. Uh, and that's kind of, I just kind of let it go. I was like, you know, if you ever want to talk about it, feel free to hit me up. I'm happy to talk, but it's your choice to believe what you believe. Um, and, you know, I think if I had pushed the issue, it probably would have led to us being unhappy with each other. So, you know, preserving that friendship and eventually being a resource should that person choose is is the best way to go about it. It is always better to preserve a friendship than to than to force one to end because at the end of the day, you have an entire life ahead of you where that person may need you and they may come to you and say, you know, hey, I'm really struggling with this. Can you help me? And if you're not there, who's going to be? Um, yeah, you're right. Like, a lot of people, I remember uh, my dad led my neighbor to Christ. My neighbor had no interest in it his entire life. But he would just watch her family go to church mm -hmm. every Sunday morning. Then on that guy's deathbed, he was an older guy. Mm -hmm. On that guy's deathbed, he asked for my dad to come over. All he said was, I, I watched you all every Sunday. You were there and out of it. I want to know what you've got. Mm -hmm. Um like that a testimony is more of a witnessing tool than anything else uh you can't help anyone if you've offended them so never offend someone never come on too strong but a, a testimony is the big especially with friends a testimony is the biggest soul saver totally agree um just a mild mild vibe shift here uh noah isaac for two dollars asks m1 grand or sks <laughs> um m1 grand i'm also on the i wouldn't grand want train I wouldn't want to go to war with either, probably, yeah. but I like the I like the Grand more. If I got to pick between the two, I'm going Grand. Um. Also, I saw I don't know I think some of the super chats went away. Uh, I found one that I think you might have skipped over, unless I was gone when you asked. It's I'm a writer who's trying to work with Lucifer. Did you see that one? I did not see that one. That that might be one of the ones that disappeared when I had my glitch. Okay says uh hi i'm a writer who's trying to work with lucifer and humanize him to some extent how could i make an interesting interpretation that religious folk could get behind or be satisfied with mm, that's a hard one to answer i i will say the majority like as a writer and also a christian i would almost never touch direct divinity like that yeah yeah, so so but, but i'm not saying it's wrong or i'm saying like oh you shouldn't do it like do, do whatever you want of course whatever you feel is okay um, I, i'm just saying that you may it, it even if you do a perfect job representing it there will probably be christians who are like ah, i still don't like the concept that it was even touched upon yeah uh now i wouldn't care i watch shows like supernatural yeah. i'm not you know, I, I, it's different if I write about it or, you know, just witness it. Um, so I don't see you, you, necessarily anything wrong with it, but it's a hard line to walk. I'll tell you what, uh, I did write a short story for a class in college that deals with that exact subject. Um, if you email me, it's uh, my email is in the um, one of the links in the bio or in the description. It's the AidenMattis.card.co. Uh, my email is in there, both my lore lodge and my... Um, my personal business so feel free to shoot that over and i will happily send you a copy of that um you know that's something i wrote while i was in religious studies courses and i was trying to be uh respectful to it and and all of that uh what i but but i agree with isaiah you're never you're you're never gonna write a depiction of the devil that puts him that paints him in a good light and have christians be okay with it wholesale you'll probably get a lot of christians who are fine but there will be people who are pissed at you and you're just yeah you, here just general advice you're always gonna piss somebody off no matter what you do if you do anything it will annoy somebody so don't use am i going to piss people off as your uh your your compass for should i do something use are people going to be rightfully pissed off um <laughs> i uh i would say this I, um, one, again, I'm not like some holy roller evangelist type, but the one depiction that I get tired of seeing over and over of Lucifer is like the sad boy. Lucifer, mm -hmm. like, oh, I just wanted to be free or whatever. Yeah. And like, uh, I'm a, I'm a poor, innocent, I hate that mm. so much. <laughs> I, I think Supernatural actually did a pretty good job of making yeah, Lucifer a relatable I... character, but was still the bad guy. 
I don't necessarily yes. mean they did a good job about like accurately portraying Christian eschatology, right, right, right. but in terms of making Lucifer into a workable character who was that you could relate to while also still making him very much the bad guy. I think they did a solid job with that. Um, but my biggest problem with supernatural, and I say this is someone who watched 10 seasons of it and enjoyed it. Yeah. The only like thing that I continuously had a problem with that bothered me was the depiction of angels. Just yeah. evil, awful people. <laughs> yeah. like, throughout the whole thing. I was kind of okay with it when God was not involved and it was just angels kind of <laughs> running the show because that honestly is not the most inaccurate thing that they could have done. Um, spoiler alert. Uh, <laughs> God is not actually gone in the show. Um, just he's, the he's stepped ride. bot. He stepped back a bit, you know? Um, yeah. So I think it's just, I don't have a hand in there. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I just think it's, yeah. you know, I, I get it from a script writing perspective. And I think Eric Kripke is a genius um, as far as being a showrunner and a creator. Uh, I don't know how much he was involved after season five, though, and I feel like after season five, they just kind of, like, totally lost the plot on good and evil, and it was just everyone's evil except Dean. Like... Yeah. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. Um... <laughs> everyone's evil except Dean, yeah. Uh, um, anyway, anyway, I would say, to give you some advice, uh, the best direction to go with that is make him trickster. I he can like he can be sympathetic he can understand people because that's how he's often depicted right like when he came to i'm talking in the bible like when he came to eve didn't be like boo i'm the devil ah he was he came to her and said oh well you know the reason you can't touch the apple is because you'll be god and god wouldn't want that yeah like he's appealing to her her ego in order to get what he wants so like the, the wickedness of the trickster that's that's okay so for example like paradise lost mm -hmm. the whole thing with that is that he was angry and hateful and, and he was like a trickster figure and what people took from that is like oh he's misunderstood which is not the point that was trying to get across uh, if you make him as someone who's capable and also uh just malevolent in a sly way don't depict I, I would also say equally as bad as the sad boy depictions of lucifer is the horned devil for yeah. tongue depicted of lucifer that is also not biblical because you do not see the devil coming he mm -hmm. appears as everything you ever wanted right so more of a trickster figure than an emo rocker depiction you got to be careful with talking about with using the term trickster because there is a conspiracy you're going around right now that christianity is just loki uh, I know, trying to I've rewrite the whole and i I've seen it. it's annoying because people will tag me in it and i'll explain why it's bs and then people like call me a party pooper and i'm like okay but i was asked to explain this like people asked me to explain this I, i'm not just I, I didn't just see this video and decide you know what i'm a guy with 1.2 million followers on tiktok i'm gonna i'm gonna dunk on a smaller creator today no i was asked <laughs> like that's not just what i'm doing um professor donger again you guys are killing it with the names um Professor Donger says, uh, how do you handle people who constantly say things like Christianity is a cult or try and blame everything wrong in the world on Christians? And while, while you formulate an answer to that, I'm going to run to the bathroom. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so, blah, 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 while he's walking away, blah, blah, blah. Hey, you guys are really cool. Thank you for the donations. Aiden's really going to appreciate it. He doesn't know is that I'm going to refuse the donations because as I said, or I'm going to refuse my cut for this episode because as I said earlier, we need to get him doing YouTube full time. Uh, so it really does mean a lot. I greatly appreciate it. You guys are fantastic. So thank you all very much. Um, for the question about, what, what was the I always forget the question after I do that hinge spiel. Oh, um, what do I say to people who say that like Christianity is a cult and evil and whatnot? Uh, it is the same way that you would approach anyone with an idea who does not like your idea, right? If someone is vehemently like, these are my beliefs, you don't just tell them they're wrong, right? If I come up to someone who says, like, Christianity is a cult and church evil and all that stuff, I'm not going to be like, uh-uh, idiot. <laughs> like, that doesn't get anything done. Um, if the, it depends on the kind of person, too, right? 
they're just someone who's mad and wants to be mad and they just want to keep being like up oh, here's a gotcha you're not supposed to eat shellfish oh here's another thing job uh yeah what do you got to say about that idiot or like they don't actually care to know they just want to be upset you can't really do anything there like like if someone it, it's literally the same premise as a bully right if a bully wants to be mean to you they're going to find a reason to be mean at you it's not like if someone says that your hair's bad if you cut your hair that'll fix it like they're going to continue to be mean so it's it, like so it well there we go as we mentioned earlier pearls before the swine if someone's purpose is to just be mean and be upset you're not going to help them with reason um now however someone's legitimately curious uh, if their question is well i just think you know that christianity is evil it's that and to some degree i would agree with them i would say that a lot of the religion not the belief the religion of christianity has done a lot caused a lot of hurt a bunch of people as i mentioned earlier have touted the flag of god to do evil and i would relate to them on that i would say yes i agree that there are a lot of evil people who do bad things in the name of god but do you know what happens when people properly do the things of god and just like talk to him as a friend um in both situations both with the person who just wants to be mad and someone who's legitimately curious and this is the like people out there who are a christian or believe in god i cannot stress this enough the most important tool you have is your testimony the way that you behave the uh the reputation you have with others because if you say you're a christian and you stab your friends in the back you uh gossip you uh, run your mouth, you get into fights, whatever. If you are just as bad as everyone else, they are not going to look to you or your solutions as being the way out. They're going to look to you as another person who's everyone else. If you ruin your testimony, like I cannot stress this enough, ruining your testimony, as mentioned with Ananias and Sapphira, right? Ruining your testimony has detrimental consequences to you and the souls of those around you. If someone is upset, if they just want to be mad, and they see you not reacting to that, if you keep your temperaments and your patience, that will speak to them more than you yelling back at them about how Christianity isn't evil ever will. The same if someone legitimately wants to know. If you're, if some, if someone comes to me and is like, I think Christianity's wrong. If I'm, I'm like, well, I think you're wrong, idiot. Does that help? It just gratifies me. That doesn't do anything. But if I say, yeah, I see where you're coming from with that. Uh, let's talk about it. That's again a testimony going forward like the, the biggest thing that matters with any the same thing we that aiden and i talked about when it comes to friendship like if you are just as miserable and awful all the time as everyone else your friend's not going to come to you whenever he feels down or depressed um but if you are seen as sort of a lighthouse for people to follow then they might um it, with any part of christianity it just comes down to maintaining yourself so that you can be someone to look to not someone to bring others down when it comes to people like that i would say that's the application be understanding above all else because a lot of people how i mentioned that your testimony can ruin reputation for those people a lot of people who just blindly hate christianity have good mm -hmm. reason for it um there's a lot of people who were some you know physical abuse when they were young uh, some who dealt with emotional abuse at the hands of some churches and rightfully so if that's all they ever know they're going to be mad about it i would be mad about it too um, the way that you are going to deal with that is to not be like the abuse they came from, not to be mad and upset and yelling. It's to be different because when they see you as being different, that's what speaks volumes. Um, so just be understanding whenever Christ was confronted by people who uh, didn't want to hear what he's saying or yelled at him, he never mocked them. He never spit at them. He, he spoke with compassion. Um, that's what did more than any gotcha or zinger to come back with ever could. So that's also one of the reasons that like people argue on Twitter about Christianity mm -hmm. all the time. They'll be like, ah, oh, well, this idiot doesn't know God. And sometimes I admit it is funny like, when you see the funny like Chad Wojak memes or whatever of like, you know, a guy with a cross or, you know, responding. And it's like, yeah, those are funny, but you're not you're not doing anything different. Um, a lot of the times the reason people say infl inflammatory stuff about Christians is they know Christians will respond inflammatory and they just want to see a rise. Uh, just be different, be better. So that's the best advice I can give. Yep. I'm totally with you on that one. I couldn't have said it better myself. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm just scrolling through looking for, uh, we got more, more chats rolling in. Um, 
got cool. Professor Donner welcome. again uh, for five says also thank you both for this content I started watching Wendigoon last year and found out about Lore Lodge through him keep up the great work well thank you and thank you Isaiah for uh, exposing more people to me absolutely my man um, we've also got uh, from K.O. Hil Hilchenko I believe is how that would be pronounced uh for five dollar canadian are there any good resources online to learn about theology and whatnot also when are we getting the lore lodge hawaiian shirt i would love to come up with a lore lodge hawaiian shirt i just have <laughs> absolutely cool. no idea how to do it i think it would probably just be the logo all over it um i don't really know uh i'll, I'll think of something um but good resources online for theology um if you're more into some of the more mystical side of things, that some of the more the stuff that I talk about pretty regularly, I very much recommend Dr. Michael Heiser's work. Uh, he's on YouTube. He's got a blog. Um, he's also got an entire website called SitchinIsWrong.com, which is about why Zechariah Sitchin was uh, full of BS, um, which I, I recommend. Uh, he also has a great takedown of Dan McClellan that is probably the most politely worded shut up I've ever read. Um <laughs> And Dan is the guy who keeps telling everybody that uh, that that Judaism was polytheistic, even though it wasn't, um, and then hiding behind his degree. Because uh, apparently him having a PhD means he can't be wrong about the Bible, which I have news for him about the many PhDs who have been wrong about the Bible throughout history. Um, but as far as good resources go, I, the one everyone should know about is Bible Gateway uh bible gateway i forget if it's .org or .com but if you look at bible gateway it'll be the first result it just has you can read basically any translation of the bible that's ever been written um it has study bibles it has commentaries just if you're ever if you're ever sitting there you want to read it but you're not sure or you have one translation and you want to compare it to another that's a really really good one um uh, as far as um things like youtube go uh inspiring philosophy uh we had him on the show a few weeks ago he's great uh, there are some things that I disagree with him on, but he's a very, uh, very honest guy and is, you know, rhetorically consistent. And I really appreciate that about him. So I'd say he's another great option. Um, but, uh, you, you gotta be careful because it's it, with the internet, you can find something that looks totally legit and it turns out to not be at all. So just remember to take everything you find about theology on the internet and it's always better to compare it to someone else's work and see if they came to the same conclusion the best theological works you're ever going to find are still from the early church fathers, though. Um, Augustine of Hippo is somebody you should read. You should read Aquinas. Uh, who else? Uh, who else is a good one? Obviously the Bible. Um, but uh, you should you should read through uh, the Nicene Creed. Um, the if you if you go and look up the stuff from the council of constantinople that's also a very good one um just i i would start there i would just use the internet for what it is a vast digital library and start with the early church fathers because nobody knew christianity better than the people who canonized there. it and compiled it yeah. <laughs> the guys who started it yeah because these guys are like you know only a few generations removed from christ himself and his apostles so you know, things get muddy after the Roman Empire adopts Christianity as its uh, state religion. But before that, you have some people who, you know, you have people who were writing who knew the direct successors of Peter and Paul and all of these other apostles. So that's the closest you're going to get. Use use the Internet as, as the digital library that it is, is my recommendation. And of course, Isaiah's uh, Sunday school episodes, his Sunday studies. They're just like cute little Bible stories and stuff, but they, they do mean a lot. I just think you do a really good job of talking about it and making it something that people can understand. Um, Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. And, and, and honestly, it's inspiring a lot of the time. Like you, you, there has been something you've said every single one of these, and I'm like, man, I hope somebody clips that. <laughs> that was a really good <laughs> little piece, because I know for me to go back and watch all three hours of one of these is going to be like a pain to get those clips. Uh we have one from Skull for forty nine ninety nine. Wow, thank you. Uh, as some weird music boy who's trying to get his passion full time, have my last bit of change for my last commission. You didn't need to do that, man, but but thank you. If you guys ever need any custom background music, would love to make some for either of you. Either way, keep up the good work, you guys. Um, yeah, I mean, we just had uh, our first bit of background music written for us. It is it, honestly really exciting. Um, but we have been told that we need ambient background music for our videos so if you have ideas send them to us uh 
we're pretty limited on budget, but we can, uh, we can if, if we like it and it's something we want to use, we can absolutely try and throw something your way and work out a deal for like, you know, um, a repayment if it's if it's something else or you want like, you know, if, if you write our theme song and you want a percentage of, of profits that come from those episodes, that's something we're happy to work out. Uh, and then I don't know about you, Isaiah, if you're looking for music or not. I, 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 yes, I'm sorry. I was you're fine. through the chat. I figured. Five, five, five more questions. <laughs> but yes, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Uh, we do have a question of somebody's asking what based means. <laughs> No, <laughs> I don't even know how to answer that question. It's just no, don't tell. The, the short version is that it. So you have opinions or reality or stuff. Mm -hmm. The original root word is that it's based on something. Yeah. Like you have values that actually mean something more than just what feels good. Do it like principled, a principled person, yeah. essentially. But now it's devolved into a way to say something that's cool, but also Edgy, of the yeah, norm. Yeah, edgy, yeah, yeah. And and when when somebody says based, it usually means that they uh, they agree with you or, um, or that you you know you're saying something that whether they agree with it or not is at least you know interesting. Um, it's good, yeah. basically. Job <laughs> based is generally a positive. Uh, That's hopefully. Yeah. Floriana G says thanks for the great stream, and I appreciate that it was a longer one. Keep up the great work. Thank you, and we will we will continue to keep up yeah. the great work. Or at least the decent work. <laughs> Not everything can be great all the time. Um, let's see. Uh, we have another one from uh, K.O. Uh, um This is extra for not pronouncing my name as Chow. It's whatever one does. <laughs> at first I thought it was Kato. And then I was like, wait, that's an I, not a T. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm glad I got... I, I hope I got it right. I'm glad I didn't do what everyone does. Um the RT nerd for five says, would you say that your religious background helps you with research and explanations in your videos? Um, I would say that my religious education background definitely helps a lot. Um, and it, de you know, being open to the, the stories of the old Testament where all of these more mystical things happen, um, and growing up with that has definitely helped me keep an open mind to the stories of other cultures. So yeah, I, I would say that the, you know, my religious background has been a positive in terms of, uh, my research. So Isaiah is for, for you? Um, yes, mostly because my Christianity has defined me as a person. Uh, it's my roots for a lot of my beliefs and stuff. Um, I've had people ask me how I, because I do go down a lot of, I guess, dark rabbit holes. Like, how do you stay, like, positive going through all that and whatnot? Because I have a foundation that is bigger than whatever, you know, topic I search or whatnot. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's put me this far. <laughs> it's what's got me to this point. Uh, so yeah, I'd say so. Ooh, we're, we're out of super chats at this point, but there is an interesting one that I want to add that I, I like in here. Um, in the Dante's heaven video, did you ever realize that out of the seven layers of heaven, only seven layers have humans residing in it? Yes. <laughs> I, had to, I had to think about what the question was asking yes uh so dante does that a lot right so every every part there's three parts trinity every part has nine layers that's three prime mm -hmm. uh, or not three prime that's three squared so you have uh no not th yes yeah three yeah, squared sure. um you have the different you have like a paradigm of the trinity and each layer had like you know there are parts of like seven sub layers and i didn't go into it a lot in the video be three cubed because nine layers three oh, three times three is nine yeah but nine times three is 27 which is three cubed correct okay yeah 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 so like the entire i was talking about oh you're talking layer. about the layer yeah okay yeah, yeah. i see what you mean then but then you are correct it's three cubed for the entire thing i didn't go into it a lot in the video but there was a ton of numerology like that there were parts where it talked about how there were 333 souls in certain layers where it talked about how uh there were 12 seats gathered around a mention of the the 12 which is mm -hmm. a number biblical the number that stuff was all over there but yes i did notice how uh there were seven layers that were um uh, filled with people and then two that were upper divinity and whatnot so yeah i actually haven't read paradiso so i'm, I'm gonna have to go back and watch your video on it it's, it's really good i cried <laughs> 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 my video the book yeah. <laughs> fair tea, so i figured that's what you meant i was wondering which part made you cry honestly well i watch my own video i'm like it's so good no uh, uh, all right 
Well, is there anything else you wanted to talk about tonight? Uh, did we did we get through all those? Wow, I think you so. You guys are fantastic. That was thank yeah. you all very much. There's so many That's good questions. Lot. I'm I'm excited for next time we do this. Like, yeah. Uh, I I did see one thing. Someone said it's not a question. They said uh, I don't know if I'm worthy. Christ, you are. Um, you are. Um, Paul, uh, arguably greatest Christian who ever lived. The job where he murdered Christians before he became one. Um, ever David, the man after God's own heart killed a man so that he could sleep with his wife um everyone moses the people who let the, the forefather mm -hmm. of the children of israel betrayed god and smote a rock that god told him not to like every, everyone is divine for faith that's yep. something that um a bunch of the early christians had trouble with they asked how could god love me and uh, cornelius who i mentioned earlier the first roman convert asked how could he sacrifice himself for me and peter said the point of it is he sacrificed himself for everyone exactly. so that every soul has the opportunity to know God. So in short, you are you are worthy yeah. of God. That, that's... Well, let me put it this way: no, none of us are worthy. None of us earned God. It's in spite of us. Mm -hmm. God sacrificed Himself for everyone. Yeah. So. so, but but if that's ever your worry that you're not enough, or you're not good enough, that's don't don't ever worry about that. What matters is that you're trying. Now, if you're not trying, try. But if if you're if if you're trying, you're yeah. you're you're enough. That's and and we go back to the whole yeah. agnostic thing. But yeah. <laughs> um, Chance Prevet says, for ten dollars, do you believe? Do you think people of other religious beliefs who prescribe to the light side go to heaven or hell? If you're a good human, are you damned? If you don't believe in the Christian God, we touched on this a bit earlier. Um, it th there is a range of belief systems about this. Uh, I, I was, I, I was kind of in agreement with what you suggested in there, um, that, you know, if, if you're not exposed to Christianity and you act to be good, you try to be a good person, whether that's for your religion or just in general, because that's who you want to be. I think that you are probably going to be in better standing than, uh, somebody who is Christian and does not follow Christ or somebody who has been exposed and rejects it, um, so I'd say, I'd say, yeah, I think, you know, I think that that's, that's where the gray area is. That's where the tricky part is. But I, I would like to believe based on my understanding of the Bible that God does not, you know, damn you to eternal torment just because you didn't know. Uh, like I said earlier, I think God's grace is sufficient. A case I always think it about is, are you familiar with the Ethiopian eunuch? Uh, no. So, um... In Acts, again, I know this because I've been doing a study of it with my class. Early on in Acts, um, Timothy, not Tim, Philip, Philip is walking through uh, the city at Jerusalem, and there is an Ethiopian eunuch. Uh, mm -hmm. A eunuch is essentially like a secondary person to a king. I don't uh, like well, a, there's a there's a very well, okay, specific okay, thing okay, that makes okay, you okay, a eunuch. Okay, 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 okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. We know, we know. <laughs> the eunuch, as it's mentioned here, was like a governor. He was a judge. It even says he was with the legion of the king as a ruler over a providence, right? So I understand that a eunuch is someone who's castrated, yeah. essentially. Uh, that was something that was done to people at the time. But this eunuch was a ruler over an area in Ethiopia. So this Ethiopian legion is traveling. And it says as Philip is walking by, he feels the spirit tell him to go speak to this man. But it goes up to the Ethiopian eunuch. And the uh, um, Philip says, what are you doing? And the eunuch is reading the book of Isaiah. He's reading the Old Testament. And he goes, I wish someone could show me what this means. <laughs> which, which Philip, one of the people who was with Jesus, just so happens to be there. And he's like, I, I think I could take a look at it for you. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's it's one of my favorite passages from Isaiah that he's reading. He's reading the passage that says... Um, was brought as a lamb to the slaughter as mm -hmm. a sheep before his shears is dumb um which for those that don't know that is again the prophet isaiah prophesying about when christ comes and he's saying that as a sheep is dumb is it uh, like if, for those that don't know when sheep go to the slaughter they don't make noise they're very quiet they're just kind of led astray and it says just like that jesus went to the cross for us mm -hmm. uh he was humble he was quiet about it and i could go to it's late, so I won't. I'm tempted to go to that part in Acts. Uh, but anyway, the eunuch says, essentially, how could this be? 
who, for one, who's this talking about? And Philip says, well, this is Jesus Christ. And it breaks me up because Philip's essentially like he was a friend of mine. Uh, but he was more so than any man I've ever met. And he tells him about his friend Jesus. Uh, and then the eunuch asks, how could he how could he be silent at his own persecution? And Philip essentially says, well, I was there. And it's because what he did was for me, and it's also for you. And mm -hmm. essentially, Philip there uh, decides to get him safe. So it says that the eunuch believes, and then he says, can I be baptized? Because baptism is a way to join the church. So Philip takes him to a river, he baptizes him, and it says, as Philip brought him above the water, Philip was caught away in a whirlwind and disappeared and was no more before the eunuch. So this eunuch is reading the book of Isaiah mm -hmm. as a guy come up to him and he's like, can you tell me what this is about? This guy tells him about his friend Jesus, baptizes him, and then disappears into thin air. <laughs> it says the eunuch went away shouting and rejoicing and told many of his people. All right. So that that's like in the old, that's in the book of Acts, right? Fast forward to David Livingston, <laughs> one of the first mission. David Livingston was 1600s, right? 16. Sounds... No, he was 1800s. It was Enlightenment era. I'll, Enlightenment. I'll look up yeah, exactly yeah, so... when, but yeah, Enlightenment era. Or, or like missionary. I feel like he may have been 1800s. It, it was one of the early Enlightenment uh, missionaries. One of the first English missionaries. 1813 he was born. Yes, 1813. So I, it may not have been him. Uh, it was it, whatever, like, the first missionaries who went to Africa mm -hmm. is. These first missionaries get to Africa. They get to Ethiopia. And uh, obviously there's a language bar barrier initially. But whenever the missionaries begin to go to people, uh, they're like, hey, we want to like, tell you about Jesus. We want to tell you about all this. And the Ethiopians are like, like, okay, tell us. So they start to tell the story, and the Ethiopians were confused. And they're like, oh, well, let me tell you about my religion. And they called it, it was something like, it wasn't Christian dumb. It's a, it had Christ in it, whatever the name of it was. And the names were a little different, but they had the exact Christian faith. Like there was a figure named, uh, I don't think they called him Jesus. The name was a little mm -hmm. different. They're like, yeah, he, uh, he was born in Israel and then he died on the cross and through that were saved. And they were like, the initial missionaries were confused. Imagine you go into the middle of a far off land and they're like no yeah we got the same book we believe the same thing um and it turns out that this eunuch according to mm -hmm. the ethiopian history went back and began to just prophet prophetize the word of god and ethiopia like to this day ethiopia's primary religion is christianity yeah it's uh, uh, very very out of the ordinary for the region like yeah it's also got all, one of the first, uh, it's one of the very first regions referenced in the Bible too, which is fascinating. Like if you had to look outside of, of the Jews for like the oldest, the oldest versions of Judaism, if you were to look outside of Israel, you'd probably find them in Ethiopia, um, which, which makes complete sense geographically because Jews absolutely would have made it down into Ethiopia if they were interested um, while they were in Egypt right but for one that like that gives me a lot of faith because i think about how many years passed to how many generations passed between the ethiopian eunuch and those missionaries getting to ethiopia right all those years the people who read the bible and say europe were like huh i wonder what happened to that guy <laughs> that that ethiopian who walked back to africa and then sure enough he continued the work it was another piece mm -hmm. of the mission field spreading out um that's not only encouraging to me, but then I ask myself, that was the word of God. It was a little different than what most people would say. The names were a little different. Stuff was changed around. But hey, that's translation, right? Then, of all these other religions, and Aiden and I have talked about before how the grand unified religious theory, the idea that it all mm -hmm. sparks from one place, is most likely at least what I believe. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know how much of these other religions is belief don't know how much of what is a piece of what i believe to be the truth i don't know how much of that is enough i know that whenever it becomes a religion that's full of hate and no trust and evil i'm gonna pretty positively say that doesn't mm -hmm. count yeah but out of the religions of goodwill what what does count because i know that ethiopians does i know that his salvation is no different than mine um so it does count and again i go back to what i said that his grace is sufficient so exactly where i fall back on uh plaz says wendigoon is friend shaped 
Um, also, you. check your Steam. I did see that. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the gift. I will have to check it out tomorrow. Um, Someone gift you something on Steam? Yeah, it was uh, the game they were they were talking about earlier. So, oh, that's yeah, cool. Very that's, nice. I'm excited about that. Um, I think they're also trying to subtly encourage me to start streaming again. Um, <laughs> Kao Hulchenko says, Ancient Israel treated other gods the same as God. Uh, would you say they were polytheistic? Also, it's pronounced Kayo. Uh, all right, Kayo says. Um, I would disagree that um, that Israel treated them as, as other gods. Uh, there were people who lived in Israel that did, but the religious leaders never did. Um, Judaism as a religion never recognized the existence of other gods. Did it recognize the existence of the belief in other gods? Absolutely. Did it even recognize that these divine figures from other groups might be more than just totally made up. Yeah, but what are we talking about there? Are we talking about fallen angels? Or are we talking about God pretending that there aren't other gods? That doesn't make any sense. But the idea that these people might be worshiping demons, totally, totally plausible in my opinion. I think, you know, when you when you look at the way that Kamash is, is referenced uh, in, um, what is it? Is it... Samuel? Um, Kings? I think it's 2 Kings 3, I want to say. Kamash? Yeah, Kamash. No, I don't think I'm a name familiar with Kamash. So I'll I'll pull it up. This is this is the source of why I don't like Dan McClellan. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> because this is the exact thing he and I had an argument over. Uh, so let me see. I think it's... I feel like it's 2 Kings 3. Yeah. Uh, so you get to the end of it, um, if I remember, if I'm thinking about the right thing, yeah, here we go. Uh, so th there's a battle, there's a, a war between the Israelites and the Moabites, and the Israelites are, are winning it because God said, follow me, do as I say, fight the Moabites, you will win. Um... And when all the Moabites heard that the kings had were come up to fight against them, they gathered all that were able to put on armor and upward and stood in the border. And they rose up early in the morning and the sun shone upon the water and the Moabites saw the water on the other side as red as blood. And they said, this is blood. The kings are surely slain and they have smitten one another. Now, therefore, Moab to the spoil. And when they came to the camp of Israel, the Israelites rose up and smote the Moabites so that they fled before them. But they went forward, smiting the Moabites, even in their country. And they beat down the cities, and on every good piece of land cast every man his stone and filled it. And they stopped all the wells of water and felled all the good trees. Only in Kirahasseth left they the stones thereof, howbeit the slingers went about it and smote it. And when the king of Moab saw that the battle was too sore for him, he took with him 700 men that drew swords to break through even unto the king of Edom, but they could not. And then he took his eldest son that should have reigned in his stead and offered him for a burnt offering upon the wall. And there was a great indignation against Israel and they departed from him and returned to their own land. The patron god of Moab was Kamash, who is in the Canaanite pantheon. And I'm reading from the KJV, by the way. Uh, you'll get slightly different words for that last bit where it says uh, great indignation. You get righteous fury, you get divine fury, you get great fury. One translation does say divine fury. And Dan took that to mean that Kamash himself was present before the Israelites and drove them off. And in reality, what, what the Bible says here is that the, the sacrifice of the son caused a great indignation, a great fury against the Israelites, is that, that the Israelites heard the chanting and the cheering of the Moabite soldiers and decided to go home possibly is that that the israelites got scared because they believed that you know what maybe kamash is real also possible does it mean that the jewish religion at any point was polytheistic no not at all uh, the every single he's referred to as in, in other parts of the book where he's referred to by name and they say kamash uh he's referred to as the abomination kamash so it seems to me like they're recognizing that there's something that it exists but not that it's a god that it's a demon. You know, that's my opinion uh, on the uh, subject. Uh, there is a lot of stories in the Old Testament about the early Israelites, not even the Israelites, the people at the time, mm -hmm. mixing God with other gods, and it never, ever ends well. Uh, the one I think about a lot is Dagon. The, uh... Fish? God? The he was like a fish, scaly thing, Dagon. 
I believe about. so, yeah. The Mesopotamian uh, one? Yeah, he was like... He was like a fish tail. Like heads, but anyway. Uh, he was one of the statues that I believe the Canaanites worshipped. Mm -hmm. um, there's one point in, I think, the book of Joshua or Judges, where the Ark of the Covenant is stolen. And they bring it to their... The Canaanites bring the Ark to their temple and they give it as an offering to Dagon. Um, so they leave the Ark of the Covenant with the statue. They come in the next morning, and the statue of Dagon has fallen over, and the arms have broken off of it. Mm. They're like, that's weird, and they set it back up and glue the arms back on. Uh, and the next day they come back, and the arms have fallen off of it. Mm -hmm. And that continues to happen as long as the Ark of the Covenant's in there. Mm -hmm. Um, now, that was to a group of people who were not followers of God. That was the Canaanites. Whenever the people who knew better try stuff like that, it's much more bombastic. Yeah, it's, it, um, they get punished. Yeah, see, uh, whenever Moses came down off the mountain with the Ten Commandments, and his brother Aaron had made the people a golden calf to worship. What's the what's the wording there? The ground opened up and swallowed them. It's something, <laughs> something along like those lines. That, yeah, but like yeah, it just it, it just happened. doesn't track. Like if you read Kings, Kings is where you get most of this, honestly. Uh, First Kings eleven seven. Then did Solomon build an high place for Kamash, the abomination of Moab, in the hill that is before Jerusalem, and for Molech, the abomination of the children of Ammon. So there's really no like that. That's not saying they're gods. That's and then there is a point, there is a point where I believe the word being used here is Elohim, um, which is is one of one of the words for God, but it also gets used for men. So what it really means is like high or anointed or like a, a very powerful person. Um, but you get, uh, because they, because that they have forsaken me and have worshipped Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Zidonians, Kamash, the god of the Moabites, and Milcom, the god of the children of Ammon, and have not walked in my ways to do that which is right in mine eyes and to keep my statues and my judgments as David did his father. Um, so again, that's like, we're, we're talking about Solomon here. Like, that, that, that they're in no, you can't read that and, and come to the conclusion that they were supposed to be worshiping these beings. That they're supposed yeah. to, it's, it's just, it's, no. <laughs> the one example I've heard from people who are like religious scholars who say that, um, there's some legitimacy to the other gods thing is like Balaam. Um, he was the guy, you remember the talking donkey? Vaguely. Uh, that, that's the one that got mentioned in Sunday school and then no one ever talked about it again. Uh, there was a prophet by the name of Balaam. Mm -hmm. He was a prophet for the uh, Ammonites. I'm pulling it up right now. Oh, but, God, why is it always trying to give me the, the NIV? One of the not god people, <laughs> one yeah. of the people who fought, um, held one. <laughs> Say what group he was. I'm I'm looking for it. Okay. <sighs> Damn, Bob. Do, 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 do. Moab. Moab. I was right. Moabites. Look at me. Um. Anyway, he was a prophet for the Moabites, and he was a prophet of false gods. So if there's like. The Bible, understanding of the Bible is a bell curve, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's it, it, it's like in Sunday school, like whatever you're taught, like there is God and then these are false gods. They're mm -hmm. just like statues. They don't mean anything, right? You're like, okay. And then you study the Bible and there's this crisis of faith when you get to the top of the bell curve. And yeah. you're like, the, the, there were prophets who did miracles. Like an example is uh, whenever Moses goes to Pharaoh and mm -hmm. Pharaoh's soothsayers can turn staffs into serpents. Yeah. Moses' staff swallows up those serpents, but those staffs still became serpents. It's like, oh, there's other gods. It's but almost then, like demons have power. There you go. And then you study it a bit more and you're like, oh, they line up with every demon that's yeah, mentioned like, throughout the Old Testament. So you're if, like, you've, oh. if you've read the okay. entire book, these are very obviously demons. Like, Correct. It's, it's yeah. not saying they don't exist. It's saying they're not gods. Um, yeah, and, and the bell curve of biblical understanding. Yeah. And, and like, for example, here, here's a good one from, from Jeremiah. Um, Jeremiah 46 or 48, 6 through 8. Flee, save your lives and be like the heathen in the wilderness for because thou hast trusted in thy works and in thy treasures, thou shalt also be taken, and Kamash shall go forth into captivity with his priests and princes together. So it's recognizing the existence of Kamash, but it is not granting him deity status. 
Um, you're, you're look, you know, so that's, that's why I think, you know, it, there's a lot of people who just outright be like, ah, no, Christians don't believe in the existence of multiple divine figures. And then, like you said, there's the bell curve where you figure out that, oh, wait, yeah, we do. And then you figure out, oh, they're not <laughs> gods. <laughs> like, like, oh, yeah. So go back to your original Sunday school. They're pretty much just statues that the demons inhabited. You're like, oh, okay. Yeah. That happens with every part in the, uh, in, of my biblical understanding. Yeah. Um, but it does strengthen my faith. Anyway, so... Uh, what was it? Was he? Oh yeah, Balaam. So Balaam mm -hmm. was a false prophet of the Moabites, who was charged by the king of Moab to deliver a curse to the Israelites. I believe this is whenever Joshua was running things. So Balaam is on his way to deliver a curse, and his it says his donkey sees an angel mm -hmm. standing in the way, uh, and the donkey refuses to go forward, and like it throws Balaam off. So Balaam pulls off. It's, I think he has a reed. He starts whipping the donkey and the donkey speaks to him it says something like why do you why do you fear what you do not understand so something <laughs> like his donkey says something to the effect i'm not gonna lie if a donkey it. looked up at me and went why do you fear that which you do not understand i would run i would be terrified <laughs> well, that's, well that's what he did it says he was shocked and afraid yeah. which you know it's a reasonable um, reasonable but response as soon as that as soon as that happened he sees the angel he's like oh I, th that's what the donkey was afraid of um and the angel tells him a, something along the lines of you are powerful prophet uh you are going to deliver this message for me and what happens is balaam he, whenever he goes to curse the children of israel every time he like throws out his jewels or whatever to make a curse he's like okay so they're actually going to be blessed and the king's like what do you mean he's like well it's they're going to have many years and they'll be given the land so the king's like okay let's go do it at another mountaintop so they walk to another mountaintop and he does it again he's like oh man they're gonna win every battle they fight and mm -hmm. that happened like four times before the king gave up <laughs> so but but that's an example of a false prophet who has power mm -hmm. but again Moabites gods line up with biblical demons so yeah and, and the yeah. thing is they they also line up with demons from other religions like yes, like yep. I, I think there's a weird disconnect between christianity and other religions where we're not denying the existence of other celestial beings we're saying that they're not gods um they, they don't have creative juice like they're you know they, and i think people just like don't don't make the connection um and then they, they'll go to things like easter is pagan and i'm like okay i give up i give up <laughs> like, if, if i explain to you how easter etymologically comes from passover and you still tell me it's a pagan holiday I, i'm going to lose it with you <laughs> like, I'm, i've given up i'm there are a few there are a few arguments where i will simply just uh, say no you know uh, like this is a lost cause that's one of them because that's not even religion that's that's etymology like, like it's it's Pasha in almost every single language except English. <laughs> um, you can't you can't help some people. No, uh, um, Cody ninety seven for two dollars says love you alls videos. God bless from a fellow Appalachian. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Um, someone did ask the question. It says all this stuff about the Canaanites gods is from Christian Jewish perspective. Is there any existing written sources from the Canaanite perspective? Yes. They are not nearly as plentiful, but there are um, inscriptions and artwork and statues. Uh, I think there is, to an extent, some written stuff. There's, uh, there's records of the human sacrifice, right? Yeah, the but Canaanite. that's a, a lot of that's recorded by the Egyptians and the Greeks. Um, okay, gotcha. You got to remember that the Canaanites did survive the Bronze Age collapse. They just weren't the Canaanites anymore. They were the Phoenician cities. Um, and so... A lot of the, we, most of what we know about Canaanite religion comes from a combination of very, very, very ancient, like post Bronze Age, Dark Age uh, artifacts, as well as Roman and Greek writings on the Carthaginian religion, which was a direct descendant of the Canaanite religion. Um, they, they also worshipped Baal and Tanit and all of the same gods the Phoenicians did. Um, so we know quite a bit about the Canaanite religion in its late form. We don't know as much about it in its earlier middle form. Um, and then, of course, it was totally wiped out by the Greeks and Romans. Um, 
glass of strawberry milk asks i love strawberry milk by the way very <laughs> underrated beverage fantastic recovery drink after working out by the way um <laughs> Uh, it says, any opinions on VIP Christianity, such as Hillsong, Elevation Worship, Mega Churches? Do you think they're a little disconnected? Uh, I think Joel Osteen has a very, very, very long road to redemption after he dies. Um, and I think that goes for just about any of them. Man, you, you aim straight for the <laughs> just finger on the trigger. You're ready to go with that. I, I mean, think about it. He's a charlatan. They all are. Like, oh, I'm not saying anything. Yeah, I just I didn't say you're wrong. But. If you're if you're in a church that big, you do not know your flock, and that's the job of a pastor. Is the word literally comes from pastoralism? It comes from being a shepherd. If you are a pastor, your title is literally shepherd. If you can't name every sheep in your flock you probably have too many sheep and need a helping hand. You, you probably need another pastor. That's not even, like, that's not even to necessarily say that being successful and having a big church is wrong. It's more so the handling of it. Uh, I know, I went to bigger churches, I think did a great job, because there, there were like three assistant pastors and everyone was like in touch, and the pastor himself was very in touch and personal mm -hmm. with everyone in the congregation, very close friends would, he was a full-time pastor, of course, so he would, you know, come to their aid at a moment's notice. Like he, like there was a big congregation, but yeah. he did it right. It's exactly. So it's the possible. the behavior of it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's yeah, possible it's to have a very large congregation and still be a good pastor, but I look at Joel Osteen's house. Not a single pastor on this planet, not a single priest, not a deacon, not a pope should have a palace or a mansion. Like, I, I mean, I, I can't think of anything more unchristlike about uh, than than to, you know, be a, a servant of God, living in a mansion while you have people in your congregation who are suffering, who are poor, who yeah. are starving. Like, I, if Joel Osteen sold his mansion and gave out free food to all of the poor people in his congregation, that that would be christian <laughs> yeah it's okay to have a big house just don't be a pastor don't don't be the example for your community and also be living an opulent excessive there, lifestyle there's also to clarify there are certain rules given to pastors mm -hmm. that are not for everyone right in the new testament there's rules given to new testament pastors that does not mean they're rules to follow for everyone. So they're held to a higher degree because they have a higher reward mm -hmm. and more is at stake. So, yeah, like it was the same thing with what we talked about with Anias and uh, Z Zephoria. Is that her name? Uh, Zephoria. Uh, Zephoria. 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 Yeah, it's the same thing as with that. The, the reason they're being punished is that, that they're supposed to be better and they're not. That's correct. So that's that's how i feel about all of them honestly um i don't know a ton about hillsong uh but i do the, the one i know is, is joel Osteen's church and i just i don't like that um you know i i understand that you know it's possible to make money as a pastor but that doesn't mean you should do it um that uh that also on that same note yeah, yeah, like what what you said. Like, obviously, guys got to eat. Guys got to provide for his family. And that doesn't mean he should have a vagabond lifestyle. But there is a point. Um, uh, uh, what was, what was that? I just saw. Totally lost my train of thought. Uh, You're fine. Yeah, you look I was gonna say something. Oh, uh, yeah. Not to. That's not to discredit people who have had experiences or even salvation through someone like Osteen. Mm -hmm. Like you know. Oh, salvation is of God. It doesn't matter what mobile yeah. you first heard it through or whatever. That's not to devalue any of that. It's just like, you know, some some rules that Timothy gave that aren't exactly being addressed, <laughs> so to speak. Um, so for 499 from Skull, we have one more thing. I'm obligated as a lad in a wheelchair to say the stairs in the forest are super ableist. <laughs> Where are my spooky <laughs> ramps at? <laughs> Dude, I, I will... Uh, I will design a t-shirt for spooky ramps um, that I, I will, or we'll, we'll make something about like ADA compliant uh, cryptids. Um, <laughs> That's pretty good. Uh, also something I learned recently is apparently ADA compliance is very American and Europe is not accessible for handicapped people. And I think that's funny. Um, not, <laughs> not, not funny because handicapped people can't travel to Europe, but funny because like for all the times Europe gets on our case for like 
our, our social problems, at least we have handicapped protections. Like, at least they're allowed to participate in society. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, I know we've got two other ones. Uh, an orangutan. They're developing consciousness, the orangutans. Uh, for $2 says, does time only apply to us in the mortal plane? I think... I don't understand uh, dimensions past the third one very well. I am not good at <laughs> physics. I, I know that there are people who have theories about four and five dimensional existence. Um, I don't understand them. I cannot comprehend them. I think God probably well, does experience time point. in a very different way than we do. Yes. Um, my theory is, yeah, but I don't I have no doctrine behind that. I'm just like, ah, oh, that makes sense. But yeah, <laughs> that's all I got. <laughs> a, yeah, I, uh, unfortunately, I don't have a very, very satisfying answer for that. I just I think that, you know, there's there's stuff we we don't understand. Um, and I, for me, it's very literal. It's not like a mystical. We don't understand. Like, I don't get it. I do not understand four-dimensional existence. Uh, physicists have tried to explain it to me. Continues to fail. Uh, the one thing I understand is that, like, you know, you, you can, I guess, move. Like, I, it, there was one where it was about approaching a black hole and how as you approach the black hole, you kind of get sucked into... You're, you're still moving, but time slows down for some reason because of the way the light is interacting. And I, I, don't, I don't get it, but yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, uh, Sequitur Tenebris says Jesus was a socialist then, lol. <laughs> Not to diverge into politics, but uh, Jesus' whole thing was do this because it's right, not do this because the government is holding a gun to your head and forcing you to, um, which is what socialism is at the end of the day, uh, re regardless of how democratic it is. Whenever you, it doesn't matter if you vote into forcing people to give you stuff, it's, it's still using the authority of the state. Um, so I don't think that Jesus would have approved of like uh, Stalin um, or Marx. I, I don't think that would be his thing. Um, but I would say I, I, he, I, Christianity definitely does emphasize communitarianism um, and, you know, being, being an active member of your community and providing for the needy and not having too much excess in your life. Um, so I'd say, yes, like a lot of concepts that get, wrapped into socialism yeah but jesus also probably would have liked freemasonry for the same reason and freemasonry has absolutely nothing to do with government so um i, I think that you know we're, we're so quick in the modern sure day to ascribe things to various political ideologies sure, that, Aiden? What? sure that masons have nothing to do with the government you're positive on that okay one, some of us have been I need to, has, some I need of us have led the government <laughs> It's not the goal, though. <laughs> you got me there. You got me there. I, I think it's just convenient <laughs> that for such a small group of people, so many of them are in the top offices. I'm kidding. You're, you're starting to sound like a different kind of conspiracy theorist. Now. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> I just want to make sure that we're we're aware we're not going down that road. I didn't do, I didn't do that. I was talking about. I know. I know. I know. I just, I just want to make sure I gave you the opportunity to clarify. Take back everything nice I said. Cancel this guy right now. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I think uh, we, we are so quick to ascribe, like, things to various political ideologies. But at the same time, both, I think most, like, capitalists and socialists would agree that it's good to provide for the needy. They just disagree on how to do it. So I think that, you know, people try very hard to make things, you know, fit into a political box. And they just are not going to um there are some things that transcend politics and i think that if we all agreed on that and accepted that we'd probably be a lot happier in general um you know j just because you and i both agree in feeding the poor does not mean that you know we have to be the same political party and most of the things that you hear from politicians and pundits and everything are meant to divide you so that people can remain in control if you just loved your neighbor we'd have a lot less problems Ugh. what if db cooper never existed and it was just the two pilots in the flight <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> um it was required that i answer natalie's text she did text me um she asked if we would get bar mitzvah on stream i i don't know how that would work aren't we too old for that i'm like yeah isn't that a 13 or 12 year old thing i'm like too 
I'm an entire lifetime of mine late for that. Like, <laughs> like I am, I am almost 25. Uh, <laughs> also not Jewish religiously or, yeah, or uh, culturally or culturally. So, yeah. or ethnically. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, my grandmother was, but I don't think yeah. that counts. Uh, yeah, to answer Cerniny, yeah, we we know G Jesus's beliefs. Um, trying to apply modern political ideology onto people who lived two thousand years ago is just not a good idea. Um, it just doesn't fit. It doesn't work. People like to do it because they feel like you know, oh well, if I can pin this religious leader as having my ideology, then that somehow makes it more legitimate. But in reality, you're probably just speaking for somebody. Um, and you it's like it's like using an isogetic reading instead of an exegetic reading you know you're trying to apply later concepts to a very old person but you still looking for I, I'm, I'm just yeah, scrolling at the comments as people are yeah yeah so cut my hand really bad how'd you cut your hand i was oh this. my god <laughs> You know, of all the accidents right. you can have with a handgun, cutting your hand oh, okay. somehow right, seems like the right, least right, likely right, one. Right, right. I was dry firing it and flipped the safety on, so I went to rack it and my hand caught the rear side <laughs> and was bleeding, so <laughs> leave me alone. Just keep talking. Keep going with your questions. <laughs> well, we're out of Super Chats and it is almost 11 p.m., so... We have been going a while. We've been going a while. We're at almost four hours here, so... Wow, man. But this was that. a great stream. We had so many good questions. Great I feel great. like we got to cover so many topics. I'm excited for the next one. Um we'll we'll have to think of what the topic's going to be. But that will be August. So we're gonna, we're going to have to try now. Yeah. Now, now we have <laughs> now we have a solid 300 people who watch uh night up. So yeah. Um Pretty cool. Thank you all so much. Yeah. It means a lot. Thank you guys. I uh, everyone have a great rest of your evening. I wish everyone a happy Monday tomorrow. And uh, we will see you in a month or so. Bye, guys. See ya.